um, motion for approval of the agenda as ad amended. Um, Councillor Tom, and seconded by Councillor Gardner. Are there any uh, questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll call a vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries, Mr. Clerk. Declarations of pecuniary interest and general nature thereof? I see none, Mr. Clerk. Uh, community presentations. Uh, we have one presentation this evening, and it is uh, by Linda Scott, Director of Marketing of Theatre Aurora, uh, representing the Board of Directors on your 60th anniversary. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mayor, Councillors, Town of Aurora staff and the community. My name is Linda Stott and I'm the Marketing Director for Theatre Aurora. Joining me today are Steve Wolfer, our President, and Sheila Carlini, our Sales Director. Thank you for allowing us this opportunity to share the exciting news of our 60th anniversary. Theatre Aurora is proud to have served Aurora and the surrounding area for 60 years. To achieve this milestone as a volunteer-run organization is commendable. To do so while continuing to win awards, is thrilling. In fact, at this year's Association of Community Theatre Central Ontario Gala, Theatre Aurora was presented with awards in Best Musical Production, Best Musical Director, Best Lighting Design, Best Leading Man in Drama, Outstanding Newcomer in Directing, and there's more, but I was given only a few minutes to talk, so I'll stop it there. Without exaggeration, it takes thousands of volunteer hours for each production to achieve what Theatre Aurora has been able to achieve. So where does Theatre Aurora stand today? We're looking strong. We have a dedicated and engaged membership. We have a great season planned and look to the future with optimism. However, a not-for-profit charitable arts organization does face its own set of challenges. We are using our 60th anniversary as a springboard for various outreach and fundraising projects. We have many great plans to honor and celebrate our 60th anniversary. It began two years ago when the 60th season was programmed. We decided to add an ambitious sixth show to our season, all of which uh, relate to the season's theme of theater life. We love being social. Every month of the upcoming season has a social event. Highlights include a celebration of the 60th anniversary to the day of our first performance, which is on November 7th, and our celebration gala in June. Other events include murder mystery holiday party, theater games, and karaoke nights. We have also dedicated this hallmark year to raising funds for a complete lobby overhaul. The new design includes better accessibility accommodations, new washrooms, and a new layout to maximize space. Our goal is to raise $60,000, which will cover the material costs and some specialized work. Otherwise, all the labor will be done by volunteers. Theatre Aurora is grateful for its season sponsor, Meridian, and other sponsorship opportunities exist for the organizations wishing to align themselves with an award-winning theatre that is heavily involved in the community. In case you missed us, we were at the Santa Claus Parade, the Aurora Street Festival, York Pride Fest, Canada Day, Farmer's Market, uh, Aurora Doors Open, Multicultural Festival, pop-up events, and we did numerous readings at the Public Library. We are very invested in this community. In honor of our 60th anniversary, we invite mayor, councillors, staff in the community to attend at least one performance this season. Come and see what's being created in your backyard. You will be amazed. We've always been a theater by the community, for the community, and are eager to forge for ahead for another 60 years, at least. Thank you very much. Do there any questions? Thank you, Linda. Uh, we'll just move to uh, receive and then we'll ask questions. Could I have uh, someone a motion? Councillor Gardner, Councillor Thompson. Are there any questions of the delegate? I'm looking. Councillor Gardner. Thank you so much for coming and your great success. It's very exciting. How many volunteers do you have? Well, our board is run completely by volunteers, and that's 12. We represent our membership. Um, to say how many offhand, most of our board is working on our upcoming production that opens next week. I'd say there's about 30 people at the theater right now. Steve, would you have a handle on how many volunteers? Generally, our volunteer count for the season would be around 255 volunteers uh, through the course of the season. 
Thank you. That is very impressive. Okay. Thank you. Council Maracas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for coming. Congratulations on 60 years. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious. Uh, I'll give you a little ch opportunity to give a little self-promotion as well. Um, uh, where can we find a listing of the sh upcoming shows? Absolutely. At theaterorora.ca. I'd also be happy to send council um, an invite to our opening night or to any performance that you can come. But yes, our website has all of our information. We're also active on social media. Well, thank you, and that's great. And I'm looking forward to possibly getting that email and coming yeah. out and seeing one of the shows. So We thank would you. love to have you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Dahl. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just going to suggest uh, if you sent uh, all councillors, and that's the email address at aurora.ca, yeah. just let us know what the schedule is that's and great. we can get it in the calendar. Thank you. Absolutely, Mayor. Thank you. Happy to do so. Thank okay. you very much. Great. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Good. Um, call a vote. All those in favor, opposed, that carries. All right. We have uh, four delegates uh, tonight, and our, our first is... Um, Brent Copperson and Jen Atkinson from the Windfall uh, Ecology Center regarding Healthy Kids Community Challenge Roundup. So if you don't mind stating your name, you have five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we're here tonight uh, celebrating uh, the finishing of a project actually for the last three and a half years, um, culminating this at the end of this month, Windfall Ecology Center has been uh, working in partnership with the Town of Aurora and, and, and staff on delivering uh, the Healthy Kids Community Challenge, which is, uh, a pro was a provincial initiative focused on fighting, fighting uh, childhood obesity. And we've done many, many events, and it's really been a wonderful collaboration with, with, with the town. And I'd like to uh, just offer special thanks to Christina Nagio and Laura Sheardown for the support that they've offered, and uh, a special thanks to all the folks at uh, Parks and Rec who have been just a tremendous help as we've d delivered this program. It's really been a rewarding experience and a great uh, collaboration. And thanks to, uh, to, uh, to you, Mayor Daw, uh, as our community champion. Uh, you participated robustly and enthusiastically in all our stakeholder uh, meetings and uh, came out to uh, uh, just about all of our events. And the same thanks goes to the entire council and all the councillors who did uh, come out to the many events that we produced. And there were a lot of events, and I'd like to uh, pass the mic over to Jen Atkinson, my, my colleague and managing director at Windfall Ecology Centre, and she's going to whip us through uh, what, that, what all those were. Thank you, Brent. Uh, thank you for having us tonight. So in the next two minutes or so, I'm going to report back to you on the variety of activities that we managed to run uh, in partnership with the town of Aurora over the last three years. There were four themes uh, throughout the uh, project, including run, jump, play every day, water does wonder, choose to boost fruits and veggies, and power off and play. Through this collaborative, we actually also created some new offerings and activities for uh, the community of Aurora. And one of our great successes was piloting a nature play program. Uh, we held nine pop-up events, created capacity in the community and surrounding area of those who are trained in play work, risky play, and uh, how to have some deep interactions with, with young people. And we piloted uh, the first uh, Aurora nature play after school program in all weather. We uh, piloted in the fall uh, into the first early snow and it was a quite a success. So it shows us that there is a need and a, and a want for this type of programming in the community. Wellness night, uh, we've run a wellness or fitness night in every single elementary uh, public and Catholic school in Aurora. Uh, we created a toolkit and have left a legacy piece on our website for any teacher or parent um, who wanted to use that model. And it's a, a full evening offering a variety of activities, uh, foods and interventions for families and children to try out. We also introduced a snack program. It's either a lunch, breakfast, um, offering healthy foods and it is now in every single school in Aurora. Um, some programs have been running for more than two years, so they were at the beginning with us, and all are going to continue following the end of this program at the end of the month. One of uh, Windfall's delights is to put on different types of conferences and workshops. Uh, we held 
around the themes of water and power off in play, uh, nutrition, risky play. Uh, we worked with early nutrition, uh, ECE educators. Uh, over 500 people attended um, our four main activities. Uh, all 17 schools participated as well. We produced two major events in our second year and our third year. You may have had the pleasure of attending our Harvest Festival, which was located in the Shepherd's Bush. And recently, in August, we just held our Power Off and Play Festival, which is basically our big finale. Uh, we had over um, about 2,000 people attend those events. I will hurry up a little bit here. Kids in the Kitchen was a surprising success, something new. Um, working with York Region Food Network, they've developed a program that gets kids in the kitchen and also family meal times. These programs will continue as well. Success for the town of Aurora, um, spurred on by local parents and the community, is that starting in September-ish this year, um, vending machines and concession stands will be offering a, a healthier selection of options for those who, who uh, frequent the building. We also built two new community school gardens. And they are going to continue on as well. Regency Acres and Rick Hansen, all done by students and volunteers. And lastly, we are also out and about in the community. And throughout the two years, we've attended over 20 different events, uh, engaged with many, many people. And I'm sure you're, some of you have become quite familiar with Carrot. He's become our mascot. Jan, and, if, if I could just, we're going to extend um, Mayor Dowell put it in a seconded by Councillor Kim. All those in favor, opposed, carry on. Oh, I was actually wrapping up, just right. saying uh, we did many, many more things. And uh, through our Healthy Kids Community uh, website and the Windfall Ecology Center website, we will keep many of the tools and uh, resources that were developed available to partners, community members, and the schools as we go through. And a special thank you to the many, many different partners that we've worked with. It was definitely a collaborative and successful program, we feel. There is your report from our program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could I have a motion to receive? Councilor Kim, seconded by Councilor Tom. Uh, any questions, comments? Councilor Gardner? Thank you so much for coming. Uh, it, it's, um, the work you're doing is incredibly important and uh, so varied. There's something for everyone. Is your funding um, given by the partners? Is that how you get your funding? The funding for this program was through the Ministry of Health, uh, Long-Term Care and Promotion. And we were one of uh, 45 communities in Ontario uh, with the town of Aurora uh, given this grant. Um, some of the partners have also brought funds to the table to uh, introduce their own programs. And with the intent that this Healthy Kids would be a seed fund to create some long-term new activities and programs. Thank you. Can you just um, tell me what the water program is? And with the snack programs, all the schools are offering food every day of the school week? Yes. So oh. your first question, Water Does Wonders, is all about choosing drinking water okay. over sugary beverages or, or pop. So first choice, Thank we you. want them to go, the students and the families to go for water. The second question um, is that in a lot of our schools, not all the students have time or sometimes the means to have uh, breakfast before they get to school. And so we found uh, working with York Region Public Health and the Food for Learning Network that this was a need in many of the schools. And so now the students can go to um, the lunchroom and have almost free access when needed uh, to fresh fruit, vegetables and other snacks. So we could also call that food for thought. Because Absolutely. Because if the kids don't have the nutrition, they can't concentrate. And that was one of the key drivers behind that initiative. Thank Hungry you. bellies can't focus. Yeah. It's, it's very exciting. It was a wonderful program to be in. Yeah. Mayor Dahl. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Jen and Brent, thank you very much uh, for coming out. Uh, my congratulations to you. Uh, I think you did an incredible job getting the schools engaged. I think that's really an incredible win uh, for the town, and I, I don't, I'm not sure exactly how you did it, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's 
it was part of the evil plan. Uh, but it's, it's really, I think, going to pay dividends in the long run. And uh, you also had two people through the through the, uh, the Healthy Kids Community Challenge working with you, uh, Gemma Goldstein and Kathleen Coe. Yes. And, and both were really a, such a delight to work with. They were both so enthusiastic about getting out there and doing all these programs. So it was a lot of fun. So thank you very much for what you did. You're welcome. Thank you. That's it. And thank you. And thank well you. done. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? That carries. Our next delegate is uh, Ariana Daly, representing our community, our children, our future, and it's regarding the ban of plastic straws in Aurora restaurants. So please state your name, and you have uh, five minutes. Oh, you have someone with you as well. Thanks. Chair, Mayor Daw, members of council, and community members. My name is Ariana Daly, and I'm here with Jordi Redpath on behalf of Strafri Aurora, a grassroots initiative formed by concerned community members living in the Aurora Heritage Conservation District, and also for nearly 800 residents who signed our petition to ban the single use of plastic straws in Aurora. Our objective today is to introduce our vision along with a brief description of our two-phase plan to council in hopes that it, be, that it be considered as part of Aurora's environmental objectives. As you're all aware, plastic straw pollution in our oceans is not a new issue. And in fact, several coastal cities, businesses, and global leaders have pledged to ban the use in hopes of reducing our plastic pollution. The United Nations figures show nearly 9 million tons of plastic bottles, pack, packaging, and other waste enter the ocean each year, killing marine life and entering the human food chain. Straws add, ab add about 2,000 tons. So why do we care, and why Aurora? We care because plastic pollution is a global issue, and we believe that taking action, any action, in our, in our case focusing on plastic straws, will make a difference. Why Aurora? We strongly believe that our vision will assist council to plan and, and to implement specific actions that will improve the town's environmental performance, which will impact today's and, today's and future generations. We understand that to successfully implement the reduction and eventually the ban of single-use plastic straws, we will require the buy-in from local eateries and also from our community. As such, we propose a two-phase objective in order to make our vision a reality. Phase one, for businesses and organizations in Aurora to only give out plastic straws if a customer specifically requires one. And phase two, for every business in Aurora, and when I mean business, I mean eateries or any um, sort of organization that provides uh, food services, to consider using plastic or biodegradable or reusable straws. We're fully committed to making Aurora a plastic straw-free community, and we offer our continued support to this council or future council, should council have an interest in our proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll look for a motion to receive. Councilor Gardner. Okay. A motion to receive and refer to staff, I forgot to mention. Councilor Gardner. Councilor Maracas, any questions, comments? Councilor Gardner. I think this is an incredibly important issue. It's, it's only one initiative, but um, we need to do everything we can to help the environment. So um, if there's anything you need me to do, I'd love to participate, and I hope that the future council will as well. Councillor Kim. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for uh, presenting today. You know, I was uh, recently at a uh, um, location where a lot of straws were used, a lot of plastic bottles, and I thought, where is this all this stuff going? And I inquired with the local residents, do you have a, a recycling uh, facility, or you know, where does all this bottled water go and straws? And it, it was. Uh, I didn't really trust their response, and that really kind of brought home to me that we need to start somewhere, and why not Aurora? And uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, to the delegate, uh, why did you choose straws as opposed to why not expand this because, you know, water bottles are kind of uh, two inches away and other uh, uh, objects as well, so, uh, but you're doing great work, but uh, why did you stop at straws? 
Sure. So um, STRA is just basically the easiest route to go. It's basically that um, if we're going to make a change, we need the, buy -in, the community buy-in. And I think that straws is something that people can get used to not using, just as, like, as they're used to using. So it's easier to just um, uh, not be able to, to get the community to buy into it and to get the local eateries not to provide one and instead of any other sort of bigger um, plastic that we, that we use on a daily basis. Okay. Great, thank you. And you're know, doing a great job and we certainly would like, I hope the, the next council will certainly uh, support uh, this initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Council Barakas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much for coming, and, th and thank you for advocating on behalf for you know to el the elimination of single-use plastics. I think it's very important that we go down this road for our future generations. So, I commend you for all the work that you guys have done to this point. And I, 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 I think that my colleagues around the table would agree that, the, as we said, the future council and and as well as the future environmental advisory committee will take this up and and uh, take this challenge on and make sure that our town does move towards eliminating single-use plastics. So, thank you again for coming. Thank you. Great initiative. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, moving along, we have, uh, oh, I'm sorry. We're gonna vote on. All in favor? Opposed? Oh, shit, boy. Tom was trying to get in again. Okay. Um, our next delegation is uh, Peter Smith, representing Regency Acres Ratepayer Association uh, regarding the human factor. And the impact on monster homes. Uh, Mr. Smith, stage. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mayor, and members of council. I think the good news is that at least we are not bringing the notwithstanding clause here tonight. Not yet. Thank God. <laughs> The human factor, the impact of monster homes in our community. After consultation with many homeowners, we feel that this is important to bring this issue again to your attention. Several long-term residents feel both threatened and fearful as their way of life is being destroyed. Regency Acres is a family-oriented subdivision with small, affordable homes. Our older, established community is deep, caring roots and has fostered generations of families. We look after one another and enjoy the interaction with neighbors and com the community as a whole. Stable neighborhoods are part of Aurora's heritage and charm and must be protected. The transition to larger houses in their immediate areas force residents to make the ultimate and often painful decisions to sell and move away from the place they have come to appreciate and love, or to stay and suffer the indignity of these new monstrosities, which will and do severely impact their lives in the enjoyment of their properties. Residents have the undeniable rights to privacy, sunlight, and proper airflow and supersized houses rob us of those rights. And for what? Profits for developers. Decisions made by this council in July have resulted in yet another monstrosity to be built in our area. These images were taken today and show a 5,000 square foot house being constructed and dwarfing the existing homes. The roof goes on tomorrow this monster house clearly is not compatible with the adjacent structures and does not belong, and yet we're assured that it conforms with the official plan and bylaws. What nonsense. The influx of these supersized estate houses will make owning the older properties out of reach for most middle-income families. Houses that now for $800,000 will be replaced with houses selling for $2.5 million. It is hardly in keeping with the intent of the official plan for affordable and compatible homes. Why are we not being protected in our stable neighborhoods? This council and planning department have lacked direction and political will to do so. 
To think that our elected representatives don't seem to care is both disgusting and shameful. We elected you to listen, represent, and take care of us. Indeed, the mayor was quoted as saying on February 1st that the whole issue of stable neighborhoods is much to do about nothing. Those of us who live in these affected areas strongly disagree and feel that this that council's failure to find a legitimate solution is a cop-out. We ask council to rec reconsider and amend the current bylaws to be meaningful with the site plan controls for our stable neighborhoods and to stop using loopholes in the Planning Act to cover their inactions. Failing that, please halt construction of monster homes until revisions can be made. We would also like to recommend that a consultant experienced with established older communities be hired to make a report with guidelines and made available to the new council in December. In conclusion, I would suggest that the question of stable neighborhoods will be a hot election topic. It is not going away, and this council has brought it on and is responsible. Voters will remember and demand concrete results with definite timelines for implementations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. I'll look for a motion to receive. Councilor Maracas, seconded by Councilor Thompson. Are there any questions or comments? Councilor Tom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Smith, you've come here numerous times. I forget, the last time you were here, you mentioned uh, on behalf of your ratepayers group what uh, lot coverage and height that the ratepayers group would like to see in your neighborhood. And I believe it was something like eight meters uh, or eight and a half meters and 25% lot coverage. Was that correct? Well, that's up for debate. We did make a presentation to a meeting with staff, and um, as we have said, that's going to be under review when we get input with the planning department. Apologies, eight I was and under the may be good. Uh, I'm not really prepared to talk about them. Like 25 percent lot coverage, uh, height of eight meters to the midpoint. I'm sorry to the to the peak of the roof. Yes. So I was just, sorry, I was just under the impression that the last time you came, you presented uh, your suggestions for, your ratepayers group suggestions for height and lot coverage. And so I just wanted to confirm whether, what those numbers were, but it seems like you don't either recall or maybe I have remembered incorrectly as well, so. so they're not etched in stone. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's fine. Um, the last thing I wanted to just mention at this point in the, dis in the discussion because obviously this is going to be on the agenda later, is a couple things. One is uh, I keep hearing the term from um, a lot of people coming to the podium and others that the neighborhood is quote unquote affordable. And you mentioned that affordable is around $800,000. <coughs> um, that doesn't really fit with what the region would call an affordable house, number one, but I think even any reasonable definition, 800000 Now, it's more affordable than two and a half million, but I, I would disagree w with saying that $800,000 is an affordable for a middle income family to afford. That's my opinion. Um, so truthfully, I think it's a bit of a, dis a distraction to focus on property values and the level or uh, uh, the values to keep them low in terms of keeping the houses affordable as a reason for um, looking at monster homes. Um, because I, I just don't think they're affordable now, so um, it really doesn't make any sense to me to, to, to look at that as a, as a driving factor in, in whether or not we look at changing the zoning to, um, to stop these massive homes coming in. I think there's a lot of good reasons to look at the zoning, I just don't think affordability is one of them. And the last thing I'm going to say is, you know, at least from my perspective, uh, I think there's a lot of well-meaning people on both sides of this debate. And I really find it discouraging when people come uh, to a public forum like this and throw around words like shameful and disgusting. Because uh, I think there's a lot of people who live in the neighborhood who are family-oriented people, who mean well, who want to raise their families in these neighborhoods that are building some of these homes, and to cast them as uh, undesirable or evil people who are bent on profits and nothing else, I think again misses the mark. 
And I just think it's, it's unfair to not only the people that are, are moving into these neighborhoods who, who just have a, a general disagreement with yourself, but also members of this council who all of us are doing their best and what we think is best for the town. So again, I, I don't appreciate when people come in and, and call our actions disgusting and shameful. So, uh, but I do appreciate you coming in and sharing your views. Thank you. Councilor Carter. Thank you. Perhaps you could just clarify for me. Um, when you're talking about, uh, when you're using the word shameful, I think you're referring to the inaction to look at the official plan and changing the zoning bylaws to be in accord with that. Thank you. Um, and with, well, I'm, I'm guessing that the residents are pretty um, discouraged after having been to so many council meetings and there hasn't been any real action. Uh, with respect to affordable, I think um, you're looking at the whole town and wh what is available in the whole town and with respect to that. Councillor Perry, your point of order. Thank you. Councillor Gartner is using this opportunity to ask questions of the delegate to debate with Councillor Tom. I, I think there's a time for that, but it's not right now. Perhaps, yeah. I'm trying to clarify what Mr. Smith means. Um, um, so I, I've said what I think. I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. And I would like to ask Mr. Ramuno at some point what the average pri house price is in Aurora, and I think it's around eight hundred thousand dollars, seven fifty, eight hundred thousand dollars for the average price. So, anyway, thanks for coming again, Mr. Smith. Thank you, and I, I believe this is an item today. Um, no, it's no, it's not. Well, thank you very much for coming forward, Mayor Dodd. Did you want a question? I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, you sat down a little bit too early. I don't have a question for it. I just want to say I disagree with most of what you said. I, that's okay. Um, but I do appreciate you coming out. I do appreciate you expressing your point of view. Uh, and I like the idea of a consultant uh, because I think that will bring the objectivity to this discussion that has been missing. And I think the objectivity is the issue here. Uh, the average price, by the way, in the, 19, in the August uh, real estate listings for a single detached house in Aurora is $1.2 million. That's in the, uh, obviously, some more, some less. So thank you, sir. I do appreciate coming out. I think, Mr. Smith, that is it. I, I, thank you very much. Um, all those in favor of receiving? Opposed? Okay, I'm, I'm, I apologize. We really should restrict uh, questions to the delegations, and we've got a little more than that, but uh, I'll try and stay the course for the next delegate. Um, and that is Angela Scaberis from Macaulay Xiaomi House Unlimited. And this is uh, regarding uh, item eight, application for official plan amendment. Hi, Angela, you have five minutes. Good evening, Mr. Chair, uh, committee members. Um, yes, I'm here regarding item R8 uh, that you're going to be considering this evening uh, for the uh, approval of official plan amendment, zoning bylaw amendment, and ultimately site plan approval. Uh, as you may recall, an official plan amendment was only required um, for this site in order to accommodate um, the increase in height from the maximum permitted five stories up to eight stories that um, initiated a bonusing or section 37 process. Um, no additional densities were requested. Um, that was the only item. And in our case, it was agreed that um, affordable rental units would be provided within that development. So all our comments, I just wanted to give you an update of sort of where we are right now and then where we're, where we're heading. Um, all the comments from our circulations have been addressed. Uh, the application has been resubmitted uh, twice, I believe. And the major features that have been accommodated, uh, provision of road widenings along Wellington and uh, Industrial Parkway. Um, 44 
bicycle parking spaces have been provided on the surface and within the underground um, parking garage to encourage um, reduction of, of car use. Provision for accessible parking spaces um, and access underground. The provision for 10 affordable housing units and significant improvements um, in landscaping from what is virtually nil uh, right now to provision of landscape buffers, um, street trees, private outdoor landscaped amenity areas, and um, indoor amenity areas. And um, we've received very favorable comments from the town's uh, peer review architect. We have uh, been back and forth with them and they've uh, provided a considerable amount of, of input and the, the uh, design of the building has been accommodated um, to address their, their comments. Um, we are, in terms of the amenity area, we are providing a mix of indoor and outdoor shared and private spaces. Um, outdoor, there is ground level uh, patios, private patios for the ground level units. There is um, commun communal um, amongst the tenants, uh, terraced areas that will have patios, barbecues, seating areas, pergolas, that sort of thing. And indoor space, which will include community rooms, exercise rooms, that sort of thing. Again, split, um, there'll be one, um, or separate indoor spaces per tower, but they will be able to be used by all the residents. Sorry, I'm trying to hurry so that I uh, get through this. So our, our architect um, provided updated renderings based on the comments received from the town's peer review architect. Um, they wanted sort of some consistency for the first two levels. Um, of the building and then a different type of material going up from that and then um, a similar material to the first level up on, on the um, top so that there was some consistency throughout. Um, buildings are stepped back which has allowed actually for the, um, the uh, outdoor terraced areas. That's along the view along Wellington Street looking west with the commercial development to the east. And then these um, were not done to the same level of detail, obviously, but uh, this is across from center. This is our right in, right out only into the central courtyard area. There will be limited short-term parking spaces, surface parking spaces, and um, it's more intended to be a drop-off. So our current status, um, as I said, all our circulation comments have pretty well been addressed. Any of the remaining items are to be dealt with through the finalization of our site plan agreement. Uh, we are working on a draft agreement for the provision of affordable units with the region. They have advised us they are expecting that agreement to be issued by their legal department next week. We've also um, been dealing with the region regarding lead certification for the building. So that's all underway. Approval um, by committee or recommendation for approval by committee and ultimately council will allow us to continue with that process. It will allow us um, to work with staff for the preparation of the site plan agreement, finalization of the zoning bylaw, finalization of the affordable unit agreement, um, continuation with the LEED Silver certification, and most importantly, commencement of site remediation. As you can see, the site um, is not overly attractive. There's a considerable amount of remediation that needs to be done. Ministry of the Environment approval is required for a record of site condition, which can be very lengthy. So we would really like to get going, start cleaning that site up um, as quickly as possible, because that does take usually about a year. Do you Thank know? you. Good, perfect time. <laughs> All right, I'm looking for a motion to receive. Mayor Dawes to receive and refer. A motion, Mayor Dahl, seconded. Councillor Thompson, uh, we have some questions, so don't go away. I will start with Councillor Tom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, unless I, I, I missed it in the report, um, on page six of our report, it indicates that uh, the proposed exception zone for the zoning, on page nine, it talks about the zoning, R, the R2, RA2 parent zone having a height of 26 meters as a maximum. 
and the chart indicates that the exception zone is aiming to have eight stories in height. I just wanted to know if you could give me the height in meters. Uh, the height in meters, um, I, I did give it to uh, Lawrence. Um, to be honest, I can't remember what it was. 24 is sticking in my head, um, but it will comply because you've got a very specific definition. We have been working with your building department to make sure that the height um, complies. Okay, great. And I'm, I'm assuming that staff will be furiously trying to find that correspondence and they'll be able to get us uh, that information at the when the items discuss. So Correct. thank you. 25 meters. And uh, lastly, um, the uh, agreement, I guess, uh, to uh, for the bonusing with um, the exchange of affordable housing units. Um, the report talks about 5% of the units being um, affordable, um, but only for a period of 15 years. So I'm wondering, uh, was that uh, something that you brought to the table, uh, that kind of sunset clause on the affordable house uh, housing units, or was that uh, so, was something that you guys brought forward or staff insisted on? No, that is actually a standard with the Region of York. Oh. Um, so they have a template agreement and they set the terms of the length of time that those units um, are to remain affordable. Okay. And I just, if I can add, um, I believe they told us that this uh, may be the first condominium development in York Region that will have rental units integrated with it. So. Yeah. They're really okay. excited about this, yeah. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate you coming up tonight. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Just to sort of expand on what Councillor Tom asked. Um, you know, as stated earlier, there's a height okay, of five stories with this property. Uh, you've asked for an additional three stories uh, in order to qualify for bonusing. There needs to be some sort of public benefit. Um, can you sort of expand on, on uh, what that benefit is that justifies your ask for three stories? Okay. So, um, we could have built, under the, the parameters of the town's official plan, we could have built um, a large slab building at the five stories with the density and not needed any amendment. Uh, because we wanted to do something a little bit more architecturally interesting and open up some space, we went um, with the higher height. So when you do that and you, and you initiate the bonusing system, um, Section 37 allows for a municipality to ask for a variety of things, and it's up to the municipality to decide what they want. So it can be, depending on where you're located, it could be um, pathways in a park, it could be additional landscaping somewhere, it could be public art. Um, in our case, the town asked for affordable rental units. Um, so we had, at the beginning of that process, I think it was maybe a year and a half ago, we went to the region and I believe Marco arranged that meeting with Housing Services and we met with them to find out what their program was and we worked out the, the parameters with, with them. Um, and I, I think um, the planning department here had worked with uh, the town's appraiser in order to determine value and. To, to establish the number of units. So and above and beyond the affordable units, what, is there anything else that can be deemed public benefit? Uh, no, that would be the item. Thank you. Councillor Gartner. Thank you for coming again. Um, I'd like to ask you about the amenity area. Yes. It says in our zoning bylaw um, for apartments or condos, that a minimum of half of the amenity area will be indoor. Do you know what percentage you're providing? Um, our percentage, I don't have the exact percentage, but ours is uh, a little less than that. And in our uh, draft amending bylaw, because we have to submit that as part of our application, we have to prepare a proposed amending bylaw. Um, that is addressed in that draft bylaw. Uh, so in our situation, the amount of indoor space is quite large, as it is now, um, and so we opted to increase the outdoor space in terms of the common, um, like I said, the barbecue areas, patios, we've got um, substantial private patio areas, um, all, the, all the units other than the ground floor have balconies, um, and we have um, two, individual 
outdoor amenity areas for the two towers as well as a large common outdoor area that has you know seating and gardens and things like that so the the overall amenity area is actually higher than the town's requirement, but the split is a little bit different. And I'm, I'm sorry, I can't tell you the percentage. Perhaps Mr. Munro will know. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kim. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Ms. Scabaris, for, for coming out tonight. Um, just along the lines of the municipal benefits from the three extra floors. Um, have you considered providing uh, a third underground floor of uh, public parking? Has that been considered at all? We have provided more parking than required. Um, we have had discussions uh, with the town for the provision of some parking spaces that would be available to the public, like paid parking. The underground parking has been designed to be able to accommodate that. Um, so that was sort of one of the initial things that we did. It, it sort of hasn't been come up in conversation since then, but it is there. Um, it's been designed to be able to, to have separate entrances, separate access within, within the underground for uh, tenant and for paid parking. Um, so it is available if, if that's what the town would like. Thank you. And uh, approximately how many parking spots would, would that be uh, approximately uh, uh, in terms of what was discussed? Give me one second. It would be approximately uh, 75 parking spaces. 60 parking spaces for the public and that's in addition to the parking spots that uh, is in that's Correct. in the report yeah about sorry okay. about 70 70 parking spaces okay. and that i just want to because we haven't um finalized our zoning bylaw yet uh the building if there are any changes that come out of, of sort of the detailed design those numbers may fluctuate one way or the other but so far i think that's pretty accurate okay council Great, thank you. And uh, my next question is, um, I recall when this came to uh, public planning last year, uh, one of the comments was that it would be great to have uh, the residents have a clear pathway or, in other words, a sidewalk to get to the uh, family leisure complex. Uh, I didn't see that in report. I could have missed it, but uh, is that uh, part of... So you're talking to the, the commercial development to the east, yes. right? Um, yeah, we did look north at it. No, to the north, uh, the uh, on Industrial Parkway sidewalk on the uh, east side. There's, sorry, I'm not, I know that we talked about a connection, a pedestrian link to the commercial development to the east, okay. um, but because of the grading and there's a retaining wall there, it would, it's not possible to sort of mm -hmm. land you in one of the buildings. Okay. Um, to the north is the U-Haul storage site. Yeah. Yeah. So there was no uh, discussion about sidewalks on Industrial Parkway. We are providing, oh, we are providing, yeah, for sure. We are providing um, sidewalks. We provided a widening at Industrial um, to tr help try and alleviate the traffic because it sort of bottlenecks there. So we provided a widening. There will be a sidewalk with landscaping, municipal trees planted. Mm -hmm. um, and we're also finishing the sidewalk um, along Wellington. And lastly, um, you know, from the articles I've read and, and a lot of the research I've done over the last couple of years on affordable housing, builders' uh, trends, especially for high-rises, has, has uh, tended towards uh, three-bedroom condos uh, for family uh, living. And um, this would be an excellent opportunity to have more uh, three-bedroom units. I, currently, the 56 represents about 25%. Uh, is this flexible so that perhaps to address some of the housing needs for young families to have uh, more three-bedroom units and uh, uh, and how did you, how did you come out with this uh, ratio in terms of you know one bedroom one bedroom plus den and, and so forth the um, the number of bedrooms have not been 
um, finalized yet. That is something that the architect gets into um, with in detailed design with the applicant. Um, he did sort of his best guess um, as to what is um, in demand currently. Um, so there was a breakdown of um, um, <coughs> one, two, and three bedroom apartments. I can tell you um, the region in dealing with them for housing services, they were very specific in the units that they wanted. Um, uh, there was a split, I think, between one and two bedrooms. They didn't want anything too large. But um, there will be, um, that'll be further refined as they do, as they go through the design. And there will be, um, on top of the required accessible units, that are, are required under the Ontario Building Code. Um, of those accessible units, uh, the applicant is also intending on making a few of those fully accessible, which is not required. So, um, you know, with the, the kitchens going, being able to access like in a wheelchair underneath sinks, that sort of thing, wider doors internally. Um, so sort of taking it up to the next level, there will be a couple of those units that will be fully accessible. Okay, great, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Councilor Gardner, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask a couple of questions before I go to you a second time. Um, I'm very keen on the uh, the accessible part that you are mentioning. Are those of the subsidized affordable homes are going to be accessible? We offered them. <laughs> okay. um, the region declined. They actually said that they have quite a few um, accessible units already that aren't being utilized, so they uh, declined the offer. So th those ones will just be above and beyond. And Correct. apart from the, uh, the subsidized affordable homes with the region, uh, which is a great initiative, thank you, uh, the rest will be condos. There won't be any separate rentals that'll be at market price? No, they'll Kay. be market price, yeah. There will be rentals at market? No, no, sorry. Just they condos. Will be condos, yeah. Um, okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Gardner? Thank you. Um, with respect to the configuration of the affordable units, following on what Councilor Kim said, um, have you decided, has the architect decided what the affordable housing units are going to look like? I find that it's mostly seniors and uh, maybe single parent families that. That is correct. Uh, so the region. Um, the only things that the region has basically told us were how many of one bedroom, how many two bedrooms they wanted. Um, they wanted them dispersed between the two buildings and they didn't want them grouped all together. So um, they will be on different floors, different locations um, on the floors, the various floors. So the intent is to integrate them with um, the condominium residents, and uh, you're, you're right, they will be predominantly seniors or um, single parents or small, small families. So in the, they'll be standard units because after 15 years, whenever the term ends, those units will be converted back to, um, to a condominium, made available for condominium. So that would be my next question. Um, is there in the contract with the region, is there a renewal of the agreement? I believe there's an option uh, at the end of um, 10 years. Um, there's an option to extend or to start phasing out. Um, so if the applicant chooses to start phasing out, I believe the way it works is the region, as people start to vacate those units, the region will start to take those units off the list. Um, but there is that option to extend it if, if um, there's the desire. If there's the desire on the part of the region? I would say probably on both parties. If the region still needs them and if the applicant is still interested. So there's no certainty at all then? Not yeah. after the 15 years, I would say no. Thank you, because after all these eight-story towers will be hopefully built really well, I'm sure they will, and they'll last for many, many years. So 15 years seems to me not a good trade-off for us. I, that's not my, no, <laughs> we didn't, no. as I said, we didn't suggest that, so. Yeah. Thank you. Seeing no other questions, comments, I'll, I'll take a vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Thanks very much. So that concludes our delegations.
Uh, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Are there any questions on uh, the items of the consent agenda? I believe we have three. Just the one. Seeing Councilor Gardner. Uh, thank you. I can't find my items. <laughs> oh, it's the uh, Lake Simcoe Conservation. Oh, thank you. Um, sorry, that's C1. So the the question is, it's on page three, and uh, the Conservation Authority is talking about a series of 39 actions that will be shared and supported uh, by its municipal partners. Uh, I wonder if there's anything in the works for Aurora. I'm on page three uh, under natural heritage system and restoration strategy. Are there going to be any uh, restoration strategies for Aurora out of the uh, 39 actions that are planned? Um, Mayor Dow says he'll check and get back. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping there's something in there for Aurora. Right, okay. <coughs> Thank you, that's all I have. For that's now. it, the question, okay. Then uh, I move for a motion. I'm looking for the consent agenda. Mayor Daw, seconded by Councillor Tom. Comments, questions, seeing none. All those in favor, opposed? Thank you, that carries. Uh, a motion to accept the advisory committee meetings. You have a question? Should I? Put it on the floor and then we ask questions or? Yeah. Well, or ask for um, anyone wants anything to be pulled. Okay. Uh, is it a question or do you want to pull? No, it's just a question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so it's on um, uh, the awards event. So this is A2. Yeah, okay. Um, this was the debriefing on the awards event. I just um, would like to know if uh, what this means. It says that any background support information be limited. It was further suggested that the nomination form be made available online to uh, ease the nomination process and that any background support information be limited. So I'm, I, I'm translating this as that if somebody wants to nominate a group or somebody for an award that they're not going to need to prevent to present a lot of support information which to me seems strange uh, perhaps Councillor Maracas will uh, be able to answer that yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the committee uh, in the debriefing had some discussions in regards to the length of some submissions that came in, and they felt that there wasn't there wasn't really that that need to have that much of a of a lengthy submission to come in, and they felt that it could be uh, it could be put forward within you know something, especially if it's online, like a, you know how they have on certain things like a 140 character limit type of thing, and they felt that that was more than enough to kind of get the point across of of the value of what the resident has done to uh, be worthy of the award thank you I I have to disagree I think sometimes it's hard to decide who gets an award and uh, it's important to have as much information as you can my opinion fair comment all right so uh, is that it counselor then we'll look for a motion to counselor Tom so seconded counselor Kim all those in favor? Opposed? That carries. All right, so. Uh, so we're at consideration of items um, requiring discussion. And I know we had a delegate on one. I see others here. Would it be fair to? We do have a presentation from the region. Yeah, for R1. R1? R1? And they're already queued up. Okay, so very good. So we'll do R1 and do the presentation. Very best. Uh, 
I didn't see that here, so... I see it here. Okay, Anka, how are you doing? Good. Chair, Mayor Do, and members of council, I want to introduce Mr. Shu He, Manager of Engineering, Environmental Services, York Region, who has a presentation in support of this item on the agenda. Good, good evening, Mr. Chair, Mayor, and the members of the committee. Uh, again, my name is Shuhi, Manager of Engineering with the York Region Environment Services. The purpose of today's uh, presentation is to update the committee on the project-specific phosphorus offset program for the Upper York Sewage Solutions Project, along with the, the phosphorus um, reduction demonstration project. So just some uh, refresh everyone's memory. And uh, the Upper York, Regions Upper York Sewage Solution Project proposed a hybrid sewage service solution with the three major components. The first the component is the proposed water reclamation center that produce uh, clean treated water uh, to discharge into East Holland River. The second component is the twinning of the existing YDS system. Uh, to provide a redundancy. The third component is a project-specific offset pro uh, phosphorus offset program to make sure the water reclamation center com can comply with the Lake Simcoe Protection Act. The region completed the EA and submitted the EA report back in July 2014 and uh, we're still awaiting for the approval. In March this year, 2018, region received a declaration order from the province to exempt the YDS's modification component from the environmental assessment requirement. Therefore, this component is no longer part of the uh, UISSEA. So the region is wrapping up the design, and hopefully we can, the construction can start early next year in 2019. So the proposed uh, phosphorus offsets program for the Upper York Switch Solution and includes retrofitting seven existing uh, stormwater management facilities within Newmarket, Aurora, and East Glenbury and installing a new impact, uh, low impact development technology site in, in uh, new market and building a new storm water management facility in, uh, in town of Georgina. The main purpose is to, for the region, for the project to, to achieve the required uh, phosphorus offset credit. At the same time, this program will improve the water quality and the quantity of the downstream uh, water courses that ultimately flow into the Lake Simcoe. Just want to give you some background of the TP offset program development. As well, we all know that the Lake Simcoe Protection Act and doesn't allow new wastewater treatment plant within the, within the watershed. However, it permits replacement of, a new, uh, of, the, of a existing uh, wastewater treatment plant. And uh, as, the, as part of the, of the innovative solution proposed by the region, and uh, we propose the new, uh, the, we propose the water reclamation center replace to replace the existing lagoon, Holland Landing Lagoons, which has 124 kilograms per year phosphorus discharge cap, and uh, which will be transferred to the water reclamation center once it's commissioned. At its full capacity, the wa uh, water reclamation center will discharge 292 kilograms per, per year phosphorus into the, into the river and uh, which is 168 kilograms per year over above the, the, the phosphorus cap of the lagoons. Therefore, we need a phosphorus offset program to make sure 
uh, the proposed WROC complies with the, the Force uh, Lake Simcoe Lake Protection Act. A key component of this program is the joint efforts um, by the region and the local municipalities to deliver this program. And through the development of this, uh, this program, region consult with the ministry and uh, other agencies, as well as the local municipalities. Uh, we identify the locations of the stormwater, potential locations of the stormwater management facilities, and uh, also we also developed uh, uh, a set of uh, principles of agreement before year submission. This program, this total phosphorus offset program is an integral component of the USS solutions. Without this program, we can't even commission the new, uh, new water reclamation center. Here's the, some background of this, uh, this program. Following the year's mission, uh, with, the, with the consultation with the ministry, the region understands the ministry is planning to impose some conditions on, the, on this program, uh, such as including uh, maybe they, they, want, they, they are planning to have, for the, have some pre and post the construction performance monitoring program. They want a, a contingency planning in case the, the proposed ponds doesn't pr produce the offset TP uh, phosphorus reduction credit required. They also want long-term maintenance program uh, for, the, for all the facilities. With all this, and, uh, and uh, 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 on top of this, the implementation of the phosphorus reduction program, uh, the offsets program has to occur before the WRC is a commission. That means without the implementation of this uh, phosphorus offset program, we can't even, we, we can build the water reclamation center, but uh, we can't commission. That's the, that's the big condition for this, uh, for this program. So on one hand, the EA approval is significant significantly delayed. On the other hand, the ministry is considering imposing the uh, series of uh, conditions. This situation creates a big and um, significant un uncertainties for the region to de uh, deliver this uh, phosphorus pr program before, before we need it. And uh, to manage this risk, the region initiated a uh, um, phosphorus reduction demonstration project in partnership with the RSSC. And uh, the partnership with the RSC will help us to, to fully leverage the RSC's expertise in stormwater management uh, within the watershed. Also help us, by working together with the local municipalities, we also can and uh, we also can advance the principles agreement to a framework of the program so we can to help uh, to guide the future implementation of the program. And uh, one benefit for the local municipality is that the, this program can provide, can provide uh, upfront funding, invest, uh, investment for the local municipalities to participate in this uh, phosphorus offset program. Here is the concept framework of the TP offset program, incorporating, incorporating the principles of the agreement uh, from the EE as well as the discussions from the uh, post the EA. And in essence, the region will, will design and build the snowmobile water management ponds, and uh, the local municipalities will be responsible for, for maintenance. We will work together to make sure all the conditions and uh, from the environmental compliance approval be fully uh, 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 fulfilled. 
some evolution of the stormwater, man, uh, the, the context of what's happening in the uh, stormwater, uh, stormwater management pond in the watershed. And the ministry is, uh, is, uh, is having more, in, in more scrutiny to ensure all the conditions in the permits be uh, fully compliant with, and also increased stormwater management pounds. Are, are you able to wrap up? Yes. So even the RRC, they have uh, numerous initiatives to, uh, to, to ensure, uh, to in enhance the, the, the water quality and the quantity within the watershed. The quick update on the, on the, on the ongoing uh, phosphorus demonstration project, we are at a stage that we select the one pond at Aurora, which is at uh, Tamarack Green Park. And we, as we speak, we are at a pre-design stage. We, we try to wrap up the design by the end of the year, and uh, that, that's where we are. And uh, yeah, next step would be, and the region will continue working with the ministry in anticipation of the year approval. We, are, we will get the, uh, and the environmental compliance approval for the Tamarica Pound and uh, for the construction and uh, we will try to finalize the first framework and uh, for, for, uh, to guide the implementation of the program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could I have a motion to receive and refer? Mayor Dahl, Councilor Thompson. Are there questions uh, or comments? I'll start with uh, Councilor Gardner. Thank you. This is a really important and complicated uh, area of uh, environmental control. What if the phosphorus offsets are not achieved? So before we submit the EA, we, have, we had a comprehensive study during the EA stage. And uh, starting with the <coughs> RSRC and, uh, and the study, the, the project team has done comprehensive analysis on the uh, on the on the t on the, the phosphor, phosphorus removal rates and the total amount of phosphorus we can get. We are confident we can achieve. We can be confident, and of course, as part of the condition, we will uh, we will develop the contingency plan. Yeah, the contingency plan, as we speak, we would be more pounds. Currently, we propose oh, okay. the nine sites. The, the contingency plan, part of the contingency plan, would be more pounds. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, one of the points of the demonstration project is to prove that it can be achieved. Uh, am I right? Uh, it's really not an important question. Sorry. Yeah, that's a fair question. And uh, stormwater management pond retrofit is not is not a new technology. Right, it's a it's a simple technology by dredging the existing pond, to remove the debris, let the let the uh, for the uh, for the stormwater to settle, and uh, with the that's why we're partnering with the RSRC to leverage the ex expertise. We're confident we can achieve the the objectives. Thank you. Can you say how long this demonstration project is going to be for the town of Aurora? The demonstration project will take, uh, the design and the construction will, will take a couple of years. And, and uh, after the, the, the construction, we'll have, a con have to continue uh, the post-construction monitoring. Uh, totally four or five years in total. Thank you. And you said at the end of this, uh, the town of Aurora is going to be responsible for maintaining this. Yes. So, and maybe this is a question for Ms. Mahal, I'm not sure. Is it going to cost us more to maintain a pond like this? Uh, okay. We do not anticipate that the operation and maintenance cost would be more than what is for a um, standard wetland and uh, um, operation and maintenance of an oil grid separator. So we, we are looking at uh, uh, to, to keep a balance between the solution for the stormwater management retrofit 
to achieve the required phosphorus, uh, total phosphorus removed, and at the same time uh, to have a, um, a reasonable operation and maintenance cost for the long term. Thank you. And the cost to build this is going to be covered by the region? The region will be responsible for the design, investigation, and the construction, even the monitoring work. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Kim. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Mr. He, for the, uh, the critical work you do. It allows the rest of us who are not so inclined to focus on the phosphorus and other you know, chemical compound releases out there, you help us to uh, rest easy, so thank you for, for all that. Um, a few questions I have is, so the phosphorus offset of 168 kilograms that is needed, and so you're saying that the Water Reclamation Center will help to breach this gap completely? Uh, this program will help the, first, the Water Reclamation Center to comply with the, the, the regulatory requirements. If I understand your, your question correct. Okay. Um, you phrase it in a different way, but I, I sure. get what you're saying. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so in terms of regulatory requirements, how is our Lake Simcoe, uh, uh, the requirements that we have in our uh, watershed compared to that of a similar watershed throughout North America. It, are our standards uh, pretty much in the mean to median range or are we in the best practices level? Uh, can you give us an idea of where we are? The Lake Simcoe, the Lake Simcoe has uh, the very, it's a very unique situation, right? It's uh, over the years, uh, the, 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 the the lake is not in great and uh, in uh, great condition. Mm -hmm. And uh, ten years, uh, 2009, the, re the province uh, enacted the Lake Simcoe Protection Act, and uh, which is uh, one of the, one of the very few lakes that has such a regulation. And uh, yeah, it's well, Lake Simcoe is very is very regulated. And, uh, and under these circumstances, and the region had to, we have to service the community, and uh, that's why we we, attended, we went through the uh, six-year, five-year, six-year environmental assessment study. We look into different alternatives. So we identified this uh, uh, innovative solution, which is replace the use the to re use the water re recommendation center to replace the existing lagoon. And uh, yeah, we the, the new plant will discharge more phosphorus cap than the existing lagoon. That's why we need this. Uh, we need this phosphorus offset program to make sure this phosphorus uh, offset program by retrofitting the stormwater management ponds to make sure this entire program will provide net benefit to the watershed. Thank you, Mr. He. You know. I think you and Mr. Marco Ramuno came, graduated from the same uh, council response uh, school of, uh, <laughs> uh, but essentially I think what I'm hearing is that uh, our Lake Cinco watershed is a unique uh, experience and place and so there, it's, there's not much of a sample size to really indicate that this our threshold is, can be compared to that of another. I think that's my takeaway but uh, I like your answer, <laughs> thank you. Um, what is the shelf life of the new reclamation center? Excuse me. What's the life cycle? Life cycle. We built a, the life cycle we built it for every plan we built it for 100 years minimum. Of course, it requires it requires maintenance, replacement. It de depends on the different uh, different components of the plant we will have to do the replacement from time to time. For example, and the civil work can last 80 years, 100 years. For the electrical work can only last uh, 10, 15 years. Depends on the component. We plan for 100 years okay. to answer your question. Great, and, and my last question, sorry, we're asking so many questions. Well, my last question is, uh, what will happen to the Holland Landing Lagoon when it's offline? The Holland Landing Lagoon, based on the current uh, current plan, 
And we are going to decommission the Holland Land and Lagoon after the, upon the commissioning of uh, the WRC. <laughs> Uh, therefore, we need this. We need to implement this uh, offset program, and in order for us to commission the WRC, then we can decommission the Holland Land Lagoon. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure there are many other residents that would be interested in this information and get an update. Are we able to put this on our website and perhaps uh, put some information on it just to direct them to it to learn more about it? Yes. Yeah. We have an open house in November. We are looking at a date around November 20, where we, uh, we will present together with the Region and Conservation Authority the plans and uh, will give the public the information needed. Great. Thank you. Councillor Gardner. Um, this, this is really important for our planning. So the Upper York Sewage Solutions has been it's way behind schedule. We've been waiting for this for a long time to be finished. Um, so are you saying that that it's going to take five or six years to get all of this uh, built and the studies to be done before the, the, the uh, site can be commissioned? Uh, the, work, the, the work has been done. And uh, we, before we submit the report, ye report, and uh, in to, uh, to the ministry in July 2014, and uh, the five, five uh, six year work is done. We actually, okay, put it this way: we start the environmental study in 2009. We completed in in 2014. This is five year work minimum. Thank you. So this pilot project, is, so the operation of the Upper York Sewage Solutions is not dependent on this pilot project? It is uh, uh, is not, but this, we use this pilot project, a demonstration project to prepare the region, uh, better prepare the region to implement the program upon the, upon the EA approval. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, seeing no more questions, uh, thank you very much. Uh, call a vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, carries. Thank you. Would someone like to put the report on the floor? Uh, item, item R1. Councillor Gardner, seconded. Mayor Daw. Comments, questions? All right, seeing none, I will call for a vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries, Mr. Clerk. Now, Council, we have a number of delegates, people that were here, and I don't know if we should move them forward. Um, I see uh, members from the BIA. I see members from the Cultural uh, Center. And, of course, we had... Uh, a, a delegation from um, on item R8. So could we move all those forward? Uh, moved by Council Gardner, seconded by Mayor Daw. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. So start with the easy ones first. Or we'll go by numbers. Say again. R5, R6, R8. We should put them together. We'll do R3, R5, R6, and R8. So could I have someone move R3? Councillor Gardner, sec. I mean, Councillor Humphreys, excuse me. I was looking right at you. Uh, seconded by Councillor Gardner. Comments, questions on this item? Councillor Tom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is regarding the um, legislation regarding lame duck uh, provisions for council. 
and I just wanted to get staff's opinion as to uh, obviously this money was earmarked at budget and uh, conditionally earmarked, um, but perhaps just a, a verification that uh, that is the case, that this does not uh, fall under those provisions. I have been talking about Lane Council with our CAO, so would you care to? Certainly, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, in consultation with the clerk, uh, since this was uh, money has been allocated by council, it was just subject to final information. Um, it's uh, not uh, uh, conflicted by the lame duck status of council, and well, we can move any contracts forward under the delegation bylaw. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Gardner. My comment is that I'm just very glad to see that uh, we're initiating this and uh, look forward to some great results. Well, if there's no further questions, I'll call a vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. Item R5. On the Church Street exterior sign. Someone move this. Councillor Humphreys, Councillor Tom. Questions, comments? Councillor Gardner. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm not in agreement with number three. I, the Cultural Centre has been waiting a really long time for this sign. Um, I think a sign could be, I, I mean, it is part, yeah, it is part of the square or hopefully the new square, but it does stand alone by itself, and um, it doesn't even have a sign to say what it is. So I'm wondering if there's a way to advance this and not have to wait for the library square project. I'll ask uh, the CIO to answer that. So, Mr. Chair, the thought behind um, uh, waiting until further uh, plans are made with respect to the library square is that um, for example, um, uh, other tenants could be in the uh, in, in the in through that building in terms of the extra space when the addition goes on, which would be accessed through the through the uh, Church Street School. So we just felt it would be best to wait until the plans develop a little further before putting up a sign and then possibly having to change it or modify it. Uh, also, with the final final layout of the actual library square and the um, landscaping and so on might have some bearing on the ideal placement of that sign as well uh, when the uh, sort of entire landscaping for the site is looked at. Um, yes, sir. I understand your point, but I think the cultural center wants a sign just for themselves to say that it's the cultural center. So I, I don't think that there's going to be, it, it's just to mark it as what it is. I don't think that there's going to be, or certainly I don't think they want to have any other information on the sign that just says, hey, we're the cultural center, come visit, you know. Uh, Mr. CAO? Through you, Mr. Chair, I believe at the very minimum it was going to uh, highlight the museum and the uh, cultural center. So if there are other tenants, that's why we're thinking that it would also, we want to extend that to, to another tenant if there was one. Thank you. Um, well, there's a meeting tomorrow night, uh, the Cultural Center Board, so I'll just run it by them. Thanks. Councillor Humphreys. Through, through Mr. Chair, and uh, no, actually that was my same sort of question. I appreciate if Councillor Gowner come, come back and report back or a quick email on their perspective for that, because I know they've been waiting for a sign for quite some time, and it certainly deserves one, one of our most uh, you know, precious buildings in town. So looking forward to what uh, the input is from this, the committee, or the board, I should say. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Dougal. Mr. Dougal, as the author of the report, um, did you have any conversation with the Aurora Cultural Center prior to putting forward these recommendations and share with them that you wanted to tie it in with the Library Square project? And if so, did they have any objection to doing that? Mr. Dougal. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I had spoken with the Executive Director, Suzanne Haynes, uh, regarding the information and the opportunity. They knew this project was on the books to be done. They also know the project for Library Square is well underway as far as movement goes. Um, they obviously are very motivated and would love their, their building identified. Um, but they also recognize uh, that there is a merit in waiting to see what the final scope of work for the project is. The, the purpose of this report was to at least uh, lift the condition so that the 
the project and the sign can be coordinated with the library square project. And if the library square project doesn't move forward, we still can use those funds towards the sign and moving on with that. That's the intent of this report is. But in speaking with the cultural center and Suzanne, she seemed accepting of the fact that waiting for the library square project, uh, more information to come before a final sign was prepared. Thank you very much. Mr. Tom. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I've said this uh, a few times in the discussion surrounding Library Square, but I just thought I'd reiterate that um, I know that the Cultural Center and Church Street School tend to be synonymous, but 22 Church Street is a town building and the Cultural Center is a tenant, and the idea obviously is to provide a sign for the Church Street School, which would reflect all of the uses inside, and I think the CAO encapsulated that when he, um, he mentioned that uh, Obviously, we would, should wait until the expansion is done and figure out who's going to be in there before you start building signs. But I just feel like everyone throws around the cultural center and the building, and we are putting a sign up for the Church Street School, and it will reflect the tenants who are in the building. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no more comments or questions, I'll call a vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. R6. Designation of the Aurora Business Improvement Area, or BIA. I have someone move this. Mayor Daw, seconded. Councillor Kim. Comments, questions? Mayor Daw. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. And I'm just wondering if it would be nice to actually if Mr. Arello was here uh, to. Uh, to have the discussion, but uh, Mr. Ramuno, can you give us a bit of a background on how long this process has been going on? Uh, we've certainly had a number of meetings. There's certainly been a number, of, uh, a fair amount of information sent out. Uh, can you give us a bit of a background uh, so council, for those members who've not had an opportunity to uh, sit in on some of the meetings to get a better sense? Certainly through you, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll do my best. I mean, this uh, latest round began back uh, um, early April of 2018, uh, where the uh, steering committee presented a request to council for the creation of the uh, BIA. But this has been going on for uh, a number of years with respect to trying to establish uh, some of the property owners and businesses. Uh, as long as I've been here, about 10 years, trying to establish a BIA, um, you know, it, it, they get some traction a number of years ago. Uh, but then again, never really proceeded. So I think this time around, uh, there was a. Uh, a lot of effort on behalf of uh, uh, the business owners who are interested, as well as, uh, as staff uh, involved, that has really been driven by the uh, the business owners within that uh, proposed BIA uh, area. And you know, it's been going on for in earnest for at least uh, two to three years. And again, the surveys were conducted uh, following uh, the latest presentation to uh, council back uh, this past April. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, not seeing any more uh, comments or questions on the board here. I'll call a vote. All those in favor? Councilor Gardner. Uh, two questions. Well, a question and a comment. Uh, we had a delegate. Thank you, Telly, for coming forward tonight. So could we please uh, take his comments into consideration? Uh, he's had a lot of experience on this. And the second question is with, report, with respect to point three on the recommendations. I think this probably is to you, Mr. CAO. Um, I'm sure the town clerk would be very excited to be our representative on the board. But why would we not have um, Mr. Kazakoff or... Um Mr. CAO? Uh, to you, Mr. Chair. Um, it will be the economic development staff that uh, do, uh, we've assured the clerk that that'll be uh, the staff contact for this and he will do uh, all of the work. It just makes the most sense to have a, a statutory official be named uh, for the initial uh, startup of it and okay. then the, the council, one of the first orders of business for the new council will be to transfer um, uh, that sort of ownership of, of the uh, BIA to the board that will be chosen by the, uh, by the members of the BIA. Thank you. Is thank you very much. That makes sense. Is there an, an intention to have a member of council on that board? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, 
Uh, yes, they're usually as a representative counsel on the, on the uh, BIAs. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I support the establishment of a BIA. We, when I was uh, chair of EDAC last term, we talked about it uh, numerous times. Um, it's taken a long time, as uh, Mayor Dahl and Mr. Ramuno had, had mentioned, about to get it to, to this point. Uh, my one concern is not necessarily with the BIA, it's with the communication with the business community. Um, when I first saw it on the agenda, I asked that the notice be sent to me about what was sent to the business owners. And um, while technically it fulfills the legal requirements necessary, you know, all it does is it refers business owners to the Municipal Act to learn more about a BIA and or the ministry's website for their handbook. It doesn't really talk about what the BIA was going to do in Aurora or really go into even more details. And, you know, to me, we have a responsibility or a standard from engaging our community. There was lots of information. We could have directed them to our website. We had a wonderful presentation in April that could have been posted on the town's website, directed the business owners to that presentation so they could have a better understanding of, you know, what's being proposed, what are some of the visions for it, Certainly, as we heard, there are numerous reports. I don't think referring them to the Municipal Act, you know, fulfills our standards for engagement. And so I think without a doubt, when this comes up at budget for the future council, there will be business owners who come here and say, I didn't understand. And so I think we have to, you know, utilize the tools we have in our communications department to better communicate with our residents and our businesses. And so that's my concern. Are there any further comments, questions? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Opposed? That carries, Mr. Clerk. And uh, we're going to fast track number R8, and we have time. Application for official plan amendment, zoning by am amendment. Um, could I have someone? Put this on the floor, a mover, a seconder. Councillor Kim, seconded by Mayor Daw. Questions, comments? Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Uh, through you to Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano, um, are there any specific standards that the region has for determining the amount of uh, rental units uh, for a, a project like this, you know, 5%, 10%? Mr. Ramuno? Certainly, through you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Uh, uh, no, in our discussions with them, uh, th again, this is the first time they were entering into this type of uh, agreement with any munici uh, local municipality. Uh, the one thing they did mention was uh, they they wanted to, as they were going to be sort of the uh, the landlords with respect to ensuring that um, their uh, um, uh, people on the waiting list. Uh, uh, making these units available for them and managing these number of units, they wanted to ensure that it was a, a, a substantial number of units and they were happy with the 10. Uh, they, obviously, they, they probably wouldn't have considered it if we were talking about one or two units, but it was based on our Section 37 formula that we arrived at that number being 10, but they were satisfied that it was a, a good enough uh, number of units uh, to enter into the agreement with the uh, property owner. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I get through you again to Mr. Romano. Mr. Brenner, are you familiar with any other regions or municipalities that have sort of provisions that outline the number? Because I've, I've seen things with, with respect to inclusionary zoning and else in Peel and elsewhere where they use different numbers. Are, are you familiar with there's a sort of a standard out there? Mr. Ramuno. To you, Mr. Chair. Uh, n no, not, not necessarily standard, but I just, just to clarify again, this is based on, we arrived at this number based on the Section 37 bonusing. Yes. Right. Uh, but again, so that's how we arrived at that, at that number. Thank you. And, and I'll make my comment brief. I, I just think that uh, looking at other, I guess, municipalities and what they're trying to do when it comes to affordable housing and rental units, um, looking at the fact that uh, this is, we're going from five stories to eight stories. Um, and, and we all know that for the most part, this council and previous councils have held a firm line at a seven story building. Um, I, I just think that there needs to be a, a higher standard for that public benefit, and, and for me, the 10 units don't meet that standard. I'd like to see a minimum of 10%, which is 22 units. 
Councilor Gardner. Thank you. I echo that comment from Councilor Thompson. And also, uh, as I said before, 15 years, I'm not sure why the region does it that way, but 15 years is not an acceptable amount of time to me. This, this building hopefully will stand for many, many years. Um, so f to have 15 years of affordable housing, that's not acceptable to me. Um, Mr. Mino, I, <clears throat> I worded my question to you, my email question to you uh, incorrectly. The, on page 12, the public comments, their concern with lot coverage and building height. The response um, covers building height, but it doesn't cover the lot coverage concern of the residents. And the lot coverage is 50% from 35 to 50. Can you say anything to help the residents out with that? To you, Mr. Uh, um, Chair, again, with respect to the lot coverage, um, the current uh, apartment zone standard, again, that's, as we know, it's a dated standard that goes back to the 70s, identifies the maximum lot coverage of 35. Based on this proposal, the lot coverage uh, is 50%. I just want to add that, you know, since that 35 standard uh, was established, we're dealing with the intensification framework from the province and our own intensification plan with the promenade. Uh, which identifies, um, in this instance, five plus one uh, story through bonusing. And again, uh, they are asking for uh, the eight. Uh, but again, we think it's, at a staff level, it's an appropriate uh, footprint for this size of a parcel in this location, uh, you know, close to, uh, to the GO station. Councillor? Thank you. It's, um, it's going to be a huge change for Aurora. Uh, I know the first two floors are stepped back, but um, I think, I mean, it's just going to be, s s even with the two buildings and the uh, central courtyard, it's, it's just going to be huge. So uh, I agree with intensification in this area, but I'm not sure about the look of the building. Um, I'll come back to that later. With respect to the, wo the road widening along Wellington Street, do we pay for the road to be widened? Mr. Romero? To you, Mr. Ch uh, Mr. Chair. At this point, we're just securing the additional lands. Uh, the intent is not to widen at this time. It's just to secure the additional widening. If at a future date, uh, we're looking at widening um, that, that portion of uh, Wellington or Industrial Parkway. But again, as part of the uh, development should occur, there will be the additional work required by the uh, applicant to install the new sidewalks and any uh, taper lanes or right turn lanes onto the, onto the site. And if any of the services need to be moved, is that our responsibility? To you, Mr. Chair, no. As if it's part of the uh, development, it's the uh, applicant's responsibility. Thank you. Um, one of the things that really concerns me is the, the amount of traffic and the amount of parking. I, I see with the right in, right out, that people are going to go, you know, up a little bit and then they're going to up the street a little bit and then they're going to do a U-turn. Uh, and I know that the region doesn't weigh in on this because it's a municipal issue, but um, what would we... What could we do to prevent that if it causes traffic issues? Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, just uh, to clarify, so there are two axes uh, proposed. The, uh, the one opposite center is the uh, right in, right out only, and that's really for the drop off. If you, can, if you uh, there's a uh, sort of a turning circle, a roundabout. The most northerly axis is a full move access, and that's, uh, that, that driveway leads to the underground parking. Um, we, over the last couple of years, we've had the, uh, um, the tr transportation work not only reviewed by our, uh, our own staff, but we had an uh, independent uh, transportation planner review it, and uh, the comments back are that um, um, the access uh, for this proposed building are acceptable, and the, once the building's built, uh, the intersection and that stretch of Industrial Parkway will still operate at an accept acceptable level. 
so there are, were no concerns from our our traffic consultants with respect to uh, the location of the access points and and this develop development and the number of units and traffic that would be uh, generated from from the uh, the building. Thank you, and council may remember that was one of the main complaints of the residents was the traffic because it's hard to get out onto from Center Street onto Industrial as it is now. Um, I have a concern about the number of parking spots. Um, from um, my figures, there's going to be, well, there's going to be uh, 80, 80 visitor parkings. First of all, for the residents, do you have any idea what what um, ratio of parking spots there's going to be to the, what's required of the residents for the residents? Oh, Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. Certainly. Uh, so the number of units proposed in total are 223 uh, apartment units. The total parking provided within the two underground uh, space um, garages are a total of 421. Um, 80 identified for visitor and 321. So the ratio is more than one per, I think it works out to 1.3 or 1.4 per apartment unit. Um, just just again to, to clarify our current uh, parking rate within that was established within the promenade uh, calls for a minimum of one space per uh, apartment unit within this location inclusive of visitors so oh, the applicant is providing an excess of uh, parking spaces uh, uh, as per our official plan uh, requirement again so it is there is a surplus there so we don't we don't feel that there is a there will be an issue with parking because they are providing uh you know close close to two about 1.8 roughly space per unit inclusive of visitor parking councillor thank you um i i think it's going to be an issue and there's nowhere else to park but uh if nobody else on council has that concern uh, I think the last thing is um, you s it says on page four of the report that the urban design strategies of the promenade plan have to be followed. Uh, Councilor Gardner, could you say it again, please? Yes, it says that the um, the urban design strategies of the promenade plan has to be followed. Through you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. Um, again, the, uh, the, the design of the building has been reviewed by not only staff, but our control architect, who are the uh, planning partnership. And you know, as the council is aware, they were the authors of the promenade uh, secondary plan as well as the uh, promenade uh, special de design plan um, and based on their comments and as uh, Ms. Shabaris mentioned there was a lot of back and forth between uh, staff and the uh, our control architect to ensure that the design uh, does conform with uh, um, our design guidelines within the promenade plan and we've got the uh, um, highest quality design with respect to uh, the building materials, as well as ensuring that it's properly stepped back. So they have signed off on, on it. Um, it is stepped back uh, in, in a number of different areas, essentially right around the perimeter of the building. And so it does, it does meet the requirements of our uh, promenade design guidelines, uh, as well as in, in, within that section, we always also refer to the bonusing requirements that are identified in, our, uh, in the promenade plan. Uh, I'd had a look at the the promenade plan, and it says uh, in uh, the appropriate section, it says, well, this is a corner building. So it says, uh, to enhance the visual prominence of corners, the design of buildings on these sites are subject to the following. And one of them, them is distinctive architectural elements. And I, I they said what those elements should be, and they're, they're not in this design. This is a very s square kind of design. Um, also, um, well, that's, that's all for now. I, I don't think it actually follows what the, the uh, official plan says about the, the promenade plan. 
um, in my opinion. In your opinion, it does? Okay. Mr. Romano? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, with respect to one of the key features was, again, as I think we heard from uh, Ms. Shabaris, you know, they did have the option of not requesting um, 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 additional heights, and they, it, it's, a, it's a large site. It's about just over two acres, creating a five or six story, you know, very square block. Um, it's not something that we were, uh, we thought was gonna be attractive. And our control architect thought that, you know, this two, sto two buildings with a combined uh, podium. And the other uh, feature for this uh, secondary entryway being at Industrial in Wellington is, is that uh, design of the corner feature and the entrance that takes you out to uh, that intersection as well as the other key feature is the essentially three-story podium for those residential units along the frontage of Wellington and, um, and Industrial uh, Parkway North. It really sets that massing, the first massing uh, of that proposal is really the three, three stories. So those are uh, an, a couple of the key elements with respect to, you know, in our opinion and our control architect, how it meets the intent of the promise. Thank you, and the depth of the sidewalk is? Through you, Mr. Chair, the depth, uh, the side arc will be our standard. I believe the 1.5 meter, five foot. Thank you. And uh, I, I have a comment that goes forward to the uh, the site plan design. I noticed that all of the trees are of the same, are are all the same species or variety or whatever. And we've seen with the emerald ash borer how. Um, uh, you know, a, a lot of trees can be decimated when they're when they're uh, exactly the same. So I'm wondering if there can be some variety of plantings here. Mr. It looks Roman? better when it's uniform, but it may not be practical. Let me make a note of that and have that discussion with our uh, our landscape architect. I mean, they'll get down to the details of the uh, types of species, you know, at the next step when they start preparing the uh, detailed engineering and landscape drawings, but I'll certainly make a point of that. Thank you. Yes, this is just a drawing. Thank you. Councillor, is that all? Councillor yes. Tom? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a number of questions for Mr. Muno as well. So going back, the... Uh, applicant is asking for uh, obviously a rezoning uh, to residential. The town has two apartment residential permitted use zones, at least uh, purely residential. That's RA1 and RA2. Um, these uh, two zones, and assuming most of the zoning bylaw, was a part of the zoning bylaw update, comprehensive zoning bylaw update that was done last year. Mr. Vermittal? Through you, Mr. Uh, Chair, that's correct. So, um, with respect, uh, uh, Mr. Chair and Mr. Ramuno, um, one of your comments in one of the previous questions to um, one of my colleagues was that the uh, lot coverages were somewhat arcane or old and they were first passed in 1978. If, I mean, if it's staff's opinion that the lot coverages are too low and they need to be increased, why didn't we increase them uh, as part of our comprehensive review last June? Mr. Mr. Uh, Chair. And it's within any, any of the residential zones. What we did do, though, was, I mean, we, we, were, we consolidated some of the zone categories, changed some definitions. What we really focused on as well was incorporating some of the promenade uh, um, policies or standards within the uh, new zoning bylaw, specifically uh, downtown uh, shoulder and the downtown through the Young Street corridor. Uh, we, we did it in some of these larger blocks uh, along the general, uh, promenade general area. Uh, you know, one key reason is uh, we wouldn't really know what sort of standard to establish uh, until we actually get a development proposal um, because, again, that's when we sort of customize the, uh, the zoning to that type of uh, uh, development application. So uh, you're correct. So a lot of the RA2 and RA1 zone standards, I don't believe we made any adjustments to, to those development standards within those zones. So if I understand correctly that if there was a, a more glaring or, um, you know, um, need for those to be changed, we would have changed them at that, that time, but obviously the, the zone standards as they were were deemed to be uh, sufficient, um, obviously pending applications. Um, 
Thank you. So uh, obviously, the the fact that we we do, we did update our zoning uh, uh, bylaw last June, um, I would imagine that it's the opinion of staff that it conforms to the provincial policies and regional policies uh, uh, as with respect to development. Mr. Romano. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Yes. Thank Great. You. Thank you. Um, I guess. Sometimes I get a bit frustrated when, um, and that's obviously uh, why I asked that question, because uh, our current zones, uh, they conform to the provincial and regional policies. And so um, sometimes when you read the reports, it indicates that the, the proposed exceptions uh, also uh, conform to the provincial and regional policies, but it doesn't indicate that our current zoning also uh, is, is, is sufficient with respect to what the province uh, mandates that we uh, that we uh, do for our zoning and, and official plan. Um, I, my colleagues, uh, I thought, uh, spoke, who spoke earlier, kind of hit the nail on the head with respect to the bonusing provisions and what the town is uh, getting in return for some of the exceptions that are being requested. Um, I, think, I think I echo Councillor Thompson's uh, point of view, and I, I think that 5% for affordable housing is, is much too low. Uh, I have a question on that, a quick question on that, uh, Mr. Ramuno, and that is you mentioned that there was a, um, a uh, set of guidelines or criteria that you followed um, that uh, led you to the kind of 5% allocation. Uh, but our official plan indicates that uh, zoning bon or bonusing for height is from 5 to 6. So my question is, did you calculate the uh, bonusing uh, for height um, versus affordable housing? based on one story of bonusing or three stories of bonusing? Because I think it would be pretty interesting if they asked for one story and we only gave them, what, 2% of affordable housing units? So I'd just like to know how you came about that cap calculation. Certainly through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so under the official plan, uh, the site's designated for five uh, plus one bonusing. They've okay. asked for eight. So it was based on the additional three floors. Uh, again, and also, and our official plan also identi identifies the benefits being, you know, public art, additional park land, and and uh, affordable housing or seniors housing. But no, we calculate it based on the additional three uh, floors of height, which, five to eight, which is ten units, which is ten units. That's right. Okay. Uh, again, I I, th I just think that seems a little low, and I'll just summarize a little bit what exceptions um, the proponent is asking for in this regard. Uh, we mentioned three extra stories, 51% uh, reduction in required lot area, 70% 70 cent produ 70 reduction in front yard setbacks, 70% reduction in interior side yard setbacks, a 77% reduction in exterior side yard setbacks, a 15% increase in lot coverage, and a 100% increase in buildings per lot. And in exchange for that, the town gets 5% affordable housing units, 10 units, that will expire, I mean, I guess that's, the, I learned that tonight, that that's the regional policy, that will expire after 15 years. This building will be here likely for, you know, over a century perhaps, or even longer. Um, and again, we seem to be giving up quite a lot uh, in terms of uh, what we're willing to, uh, to, uh, to see this uh, development move forward. And I think that we can expect a little bit more uh, back in return. Uh, whether that's in the increase of the percentage of units, if that's not possible, then adding parking, as Councillor Kim mentioned, uh, during the delegation, uh, adding parking, public parking for the GO station, or uh, uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, any other provisions that we could p possibly ask for with, uh, that's within the um, bon bonusing provisions. Um, so to, I don't know how we would exact that at this stage in the uh, development, because it seems as if you know, I'm not sure how we go back to the drawing board or, you know, how the process will work. Um, obviously, we're making recommendations to council next week. But because um, on the other hand, I do believe that this is an appropriate area for intensification. And I think that, you know, I, the buildings look quite attractive as well, um, at least to my mind. Um, and I think it would be good for the area. But I just think that, uh, you know, we set our zoning standards and updated them last year. We didn't make any changes to RA2. And as I just stated, the proponent's asking for a, a quite significant amount of, uh, of concessions from the town. So from my perspective, uh, I don't think we're getting enough in return uh, to warrant uh, that many concessions. Thank you. Councillor Kim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
to you, Mr. Chair, to uh, Mr. Marco. Uh, can you confirm uh, approximately when the land transaction took place between uh, the owner, the previous owner of uh, Royal, Royal Woodworking and the, uh, the builder, please? Mr. Romano. To you, Mr. Uh, Chair, um, I think you know the applications were submitted back in early 2015. So I think the uh, the, the current uh, the applicant purchased the property uh, 2014, <coughs> 2015. It's been three three four years. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's what I thought. And you know, just doing some back of the hand calculations, and um, and just from my general knowledge of the uh, the development community. There was a time when, uh, when builders, you know, had lots you know, that was that were land banked from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Certainly, they made uh, quite a fortune because they purchased those lands way back. Uh, the the more modern or the the uh, current builders who purchased over the last several years, you know, the, the typical net margin on a project is roughly about 20 percent. Uh, contrary to what uh, many people feel that they're making a huge profit and uh, you know uh, I'm not sure that's always the case it might be the case sometimes and so what I'm getting at is typically the, the margin is around 20 percent uh, my view of uh, the bonusing and the, and the 10 percent that was abandoned out there uh, I view 10 percent not from the overall units but from the extra units that's being built, which is roughly, I believe those three floors on those two buildings would be about 84 units. They're offering 10, so that's roughly about uh, 12 percent. Uh, so roughly, you know, we know that they can build, we can negotiate with the concessions, and I agree with Councillor Tom that uh, we are, they are asking for a lot of concessions, and certainly we need to negotiate uh, with them on those uh, concessions. But all I'm saying is that we do need to have a bigger picture in that uh, they, they're probably break even is probably roughly uh, 16 units uh, for those extra three floors. They're offering 10, and so their, their margin is probably those six, uh, four or six additional units, or give, give or take two. So we ask for 16, 20, 22. They'll probably c go back and say, "Well, we don't need eight stories. We'll just we'll be happy with five. Now, those three extra units are going to give us development charges of approximately eight hundred thousand dollars. Now, we have, uh, you know, our our DC flows are in good shape. Uh, we we've done that in our finance advisory committee, uh, but we have an opportunity for eight hundred thousand for develop development charges." That will go a long way to through. Um, not that we necessarily need more, but uh, it's always nice to have a buffer when we have Library Square. You know, we have we always have our cultural partners in there. We have our library. Uh, we have our multi-use rec center. You know, we're talking about the addition on the, the Stronic. So this will go a long way. So I think we need to keep in mind the extra revenues that will be coming in uh, from the three extra units. We already know we're built out. We can't go uh, horizontally, it's vertically. If we're gonna have intensification based on the provincial uh, policy statements and their intensification targets, uh, this would be the ideal location, which we all know. And for those who say that this is this sets a precedent, I don't think it does because there's, on, there's only really one or two areas in Aurora where you can uh, grow vertically. We're not gonna do this on the Young Corridor. Uh, we're certainly not going to do this in any residential area. This would be the most appropriate location. And I think uh, not going, not offering uh, floors, whether it be one, two, or three, I'm not going to argue about that, or five. Uh, I'm just saying that there is a lost opportunity for revenues for the town that will uh, is assist all residents, future and current. Um, so, you know, if, if we, again, we asked for 16, 18, 20 units. Um, I suspect the builder will come back and say, okay, well, we can't do that because it's not feasible financially for them. Uh, and, and sure, we, you know, we love Aurora. We, we love our low rises and we want uh, Aurora to be like it was 30 years ago, but we know that's not the case and, and we can't, uh, uh, no, we, we wanna manage our build. 
manage, manage our finances. And uh, I think uh, this is an appropriate place to do this. And I think uh, it seems like the builder is, willing, is flexible and willing to give us, uh, as mentioned earlier, you know, 70 public parking spots, you know, paid. Uh, there's a demand for living spaces that's close to a transportation hub like the GO train station and the Young Street Viva. We need intensification and the targets that we have, why not try to meet those targets in advance or have some uh, a buffer to do it here? Uh, so it makes sense to me to, uh, you know, uh, I would approve this, but certainly, you know, uh, we want to negotiate with uh, the builder in terms of uh, some of the concessions that, uh, uh, that they're asking for. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, I, I'm not going to try and sit here and justify the break-even point for um, the development, but I will say this. Um, you don't have to look far. You can look across the street um, to this building to see what might not be the most aesthetically pleasing uh, mid-rise in Aurora. Uh, I'd, it's five stories. Um, from my perspective, would I be willing to, to give up uh, some extra stories and to have more stories on this site as opposed to an ugly U-shaped building, which would then fall in line with, with some of the requirements that they're asking for? You know, there would only be one building on site instead of two. Well, that, you know, as was stated, was a 50% uh, or a hundred percent bonusing of, of what they're looking for. I think from an aesthetic standpoint, um, this will be one of the nicer looking buildings in Aurora. I think from um, even a massing standpoint, the way it's stepped back will make it less obtrusive um, than the building across uh, the street. Um, and I, I think, you know, to offset those extra stories to, you know, to, to step some stories back. Um, I see that as being a trade-off for those, for two of the three stories. I think it's justified in my mind to go from, from five to seven stories, um, have them step back, have them done in a more aesthetically pleasing manner, uh, a building that I think everyone would, would <coughs> be happy to, to see. That's, that's how I justify two of the three stories. And then the third story really is having to do with the bonusing. I, I understand uh, the rules that we have in place would typically allow five plus one, but in my mind, I, I see that as being justified. Um, just a quick note on parking, uh, 108 of the rooms or of the, the units in this um, building are, are either one without den or one plus one. Um, you know, when I was living in a condo, uh, I had a one plus one with my wife. It was cramped, um, to say the least. Uh, we did have two cars, so those circumstances definitely do exist. I would say that we were probably an outlier in the building. Um, and, and a lot of the people who occupy ones and one plus ones uh, are singer, single individuals and, and will only need one car. Uh, but with that said, there is also an individual with, with five cars. Um, so I think every situation is unique. Um, I think parking standards on this site are much higher than what uh, we have in, in other locations in, in town. And I'm swayed by how nice of a building this is. Um, if it were just a five-story block, I'd be less inclined to be in favor of it. But because it's stepped back, because it's using different choice of materials, um, I'll support it, and I, I think it uh, deserves the support of the committee and council next week. Thank you. Uh, before I go back to you for a second time, Councillor Tom, I'll uh, go with Councillor Maracas for the first time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, is it architecturally pleasing to look at? Yeah, it's just one problem. It's eight stories. It doesn't meet our, our height restrictions. 
goes above and beyond and it doesn't even go above just with the bonusing of one it's asking for three extra stories and I, I might remind everyone it's not just three extra stories it's three extra stories each building in essence it's six extra stories I understand the concerns about you know possibly it could be uh, just a, a block building um, but at the end of the day we we do have a height restriction and right now currently what sits there is one story commercial five story is intensification so by going to what our plans are within our official plan is intensifying the area we all agree it's an area to to allow for intensification five stories allows for that and so I think that we need to uphold our official plan and our height restriction and move forward in that direction at the end of the day I don't see the clear benefit to the community there is none allowing 10 units for rental affordable housing that is going to disappear after 15 years well I'll ask everyone is are the two stories going to disappear after 15 years no and so I think it's up to us to make sure that we hold that line and we uphold our official plan so I'll be voting against this gotcha Tom thank you mr. chair uh, just a couple more comments um, uh, I will point out that the zoning actually only allows uh, the parent zoning. Uh, obviously, the, bill, the the area is not zoned RA2 now, but uh, the parent zoning that the exception uh, is uh, is looking to uh, amend allows only one building per lot. So, in all this discussion with uh, w how many floors we're bonusing, we're in actually bonusing uh, eight stories on one building and uh, the extra three on the second. But uh, not to get bogged down in technicalities. Um, the other thing about uh, taking into account the developer's uh, uh, margins or, or uh, rate of return or whatever, um, the affordable units that are part of the bonusing structure are, as everyone's mentioned, a suns sunset. And they all expire after 15 years. So whoever owns the building will be able to sell them and therefore recoup any costs that they were losing uh, during this process. So um, they just have to wait. I think, I think it's only renewable actually after, the choice is to renew after 10. So uh, after 10 years they get to sell the 10 units uh, if uh, they don't want to re, um, renegotiate, or sorry, with renew the agreement for another five years. I think that's what the proponent said. Uh, but in any case, it's 15 years uh, at a maximum. Um, and so again, I don't think want to get bogged down in that because I don't think that it's helpful to what I think everyone here wants to do, which is that we want to see if there is going to be bonusing for um, height, if there's going to be exceptions that the council is going to uh, allow, concessions on our end to allow for what Councillor Peary likes uh, as, a, as a visually pleasing uh, uh, build. I don't disagree. I think it's visually pleasing as well. Um, but I think that the, the town and the community has to get something more out of it than just 5% of affordable housing that, again, expire after 15 years. Um, so I'm not, in, I'm not opposed to going back with the developer and working on uh, other uh, benefits uh, through the bonusing that could be looked at um, and, and other uh, things that could possibly bring us over the line. But... Um, you know, as Councillor Marak has mentioned, our, the, the RA2 zoning, um, it would allow for a fairly sizable uh, building. I mean, one of the things that no one's talking about either is it's, I think it's kind of curious, and maybe I can get some clarification from the staff as well. The developer's asking for eight stories to be as the, uh, the kind of height as the RA2 exception zone, and our maximum height of the current zone, RA2, is 26 meters, but the developer mentioned that their current proposal is only 25. So we have a five-story maximum with a 26-meter height. Um, so I, I guess I don't really understand the, the discrepancy there. By my calculation, I mean, I thought that you know, a story was around 3.3 meters. I could be wrong. Um, that would mean that eight stories is 26.4. Anyhow, so perhaps staff can just clarify that as well. Mr. Bermuda. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Chair and... and, and uh, hopefully, I can try and clarify. And I understand. I hear council's concerns about uh, the number of stories and the bonusing. 
Uh, but I just want to go back because I did check the official plan and again in my earlier response to uh, Councillor Tom with respect to why we didn't make any changes to the uh, to the old R82 uh, zones when we updated the, the zoning bylaw. I mean it, we, we didn't but just going back to our official plan specifically the lot coverage if I can just talk about lot coverage and height. The lot coverage under the old R2 zone is 35%. There, this proposal is seeking to go to 50%. That is in compliance with the official plan because there's a policy in our promenade plan that says for any of these intensification areas, a minimum lot coverage should be 50%. Again, we didn't change those standards in the zoning bylaw because we were going to deal with these on, on a site-by-site -site case. With respect to the height, the uh, RA2 zone does identify a 26 meter maximum height. And that can, you know, depending on the number of stories, that, that could correspond to a six or, or seven or eight story building. Uh, what the applicant is proposing is eight stories. Based on the drawings, um, uh, the maximum height is 25 meters. Once we uh, finalize the zoning bylaw, and what we do typically do is say, you know, eight stories, or you know 25 meters you know whichever is whichever is less but again the old zoning bylaw and there are, you know there are some discrepancies in our in in the old re2 zones specifically it, it does permit 26 meters which would allow you in this case i mean they their building proposes uh, eight stories but 25 meter height but just just to be clear with respect to the uh, lot coverage it's something that we're going to see a lot more when uh, we are dealing with these proposals whether it's increase in height or not with respect to some of the standards specifically lot coverage and building setbacks. Our official plan does uh, provide uh, more current standards, standards as opposed to the old RA2 zone. Thank you, Mr. Muno, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess I would just clarify, though, that um, if there is a discrepancy between the zoning bylaw and the official plan, that the zoning bylaw takes precedence? Mr. Muno? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, that's that's uh, that's the case. But in this case, again, the current zoning is the old employment zone. So the request is to amend the zoning by law for the old employment zone to the corresponding residential zone. And again, they are asking for exceptions to the our parent RA2 zone. They're asking for us to create a zone that doesn't currently exist, and by using the parent zone RA2. Right, I understand that. So uh, they the okay not to get into a back and forth with Mr. Ramuno. Anyhow, it's been said before, I guess my last question would be to staff, what's the protocol, if we want to continue to negotiate, what motion do we need to put on the floor? Um, uh, I'm not against the principle of application or development on this property. I just think what we've been presented with doesn't cut it for me. So um, in order to move this along, um, do we send this to another general committee meeting or uh, if this gets passed, uh, you know, if this is just to go to council, I, I won't be voting in favor of it. So I think we have to go not all the way back to the drawing board, but certainly need to go back and sit down with the developer and, uh, and, uh, and look at some, uh, some more options uh, for community benefit for the, for the town. So again, I ask uh, whether that's the clerk or the CAO, uh, obviously the, the, if this recommendation gets passed to council, um, the development is going to go through. So do we need a motion to just refer this uh, back to staff or refer this to a future general committee meeting? Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, refer back to staff I think would be the, uh, if would keep it alive, then we don't run into reconsideration problems down the road either. Councillor. Well, uh, I've already spoken twice. Um, uh, so I guess I'll just put a motion to refer this back to staff. Uh, um, for further negotiations with the developer, and that would be brought forward back to council or back to committee at a, at a later date. Councilor Humphreys will second it. And now in the referred discussion, Mr. Clerk? Yes. Okay, we've got a motion and seconded for to refer this back to staff. Mayor Daw? I actually wanted to speak to the main motion, but I'll uh, try and confine my remarks to the uh, I have no problem referring it back to staff to have discussions with the builder um, but there's a couple of things first of all Mr. Ramuno how many how many units is the developer the proponent obligated to provide in terms of affordable Mr. Ramuno through Mr. Chair uh, no, not obligated to provide uh, um, any zero so this is 10 more than we've got now uh, and how many have we done with, you say, over the last four, five, six years? Uh, point of order, 
Councillor Perry, what is your point of order? As much as I agree with the, with the mayor's line of questioning on this one, he's not speaking to the motion. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we're talking about referring this back to staff. So if Perhaps uh, with respect to, uh, if it refers back to staff for you to have discussions with the builder, uh, perhaps you could have discussions about looking at additional units. Perhaps you could, um, one of the concerns expressed has been the length, uh, that the length of 15 years. Um, that is an agreement that was worked out with uh, York Region uh, through Community and Social Services. So perhaps they uh, could weigh in on that, what they look for when they're putting these things together. Uh, and lastly, maybe you could help us with some of the, the interesting arithmetic we've heard tonight as to how all that works. Thank you. I don't support the refer back to staff. Councillor Thompson. Thank you. I support the motion to refer back to staff, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily in line with the wording about further negotiation. To me, it's just addressing the concerns addressed, uh, mentioned by members of council today. So, uh, but I understand the intent of it, and, and certainly I'd like to see conversations go back. You know, I mean, they first approached us with 10 stories. This now time they've come back, it's eight stories. It's a step in the right direction. I agree with some of the comments, but it's just not there yet. And I think we need to keep addressing the concerns. Uh, one quick question through you to Mr. Ramon. Mr. Romuno, how many floors is council obligated to give to the developer? Mr. Romuno? Un under our plan, it's uh, five plus one if you, we agree with, if council agrees well, we're not to obligated the obligated to then give that. That's right, we? five. Thank you. Councillor Humphreys. Thank you, you, Mr. Chair. And uh, most of my comments have been said. Uh, I completely agree with the Mayor Dawes' uh, comments and uh, earlier comments about uh, the height. For me, it's, it's, it's Eight is just, you know, just doesn't cut it for me as well. I do love the aesthetics of the building, uh, but I'd like to see it conform more to uh, the floors that we listed up five. And uh, and I and I don't want. I would like staff to go uh, back and and have a, a discussion, dis, you know, discussing our concerns, so that this doesn't. Because again, if this moves forward next week, I wouldn't be in support of it either. So I prefer going back to hopefully have those concerns addressed and come forward with something that we can all. Uh, be, be um, pleased with. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. We could, uh, I know we're, we're well into this, but if we could be quiet, thank you. <laughs> Refrain from <laughs> discussions. Councillor Gardner, you're next. Thank you. As part of the discussion, uh, I believe the uh, proponent said that um, there is a provision to extend the agreement, but the agreement is dependent upon. Uh, in this case, the developer wanting to extend it. So uh, I think we also need to look at that aspect. For the renewal, okay. Uh, and uh, Councillor Tom? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, if the Chair will allow and if the seconder is okay, I don't mind Councillor Thompson's suggestion about the language. So if, the, so if it's better to be referred to staff to address concerns raised by council or something along those lines. I'm, I have no problem with a friendly amendment along those lines. <laughs> so to address council's concerns with the developer. Is that okay, Councillor Humphreys? Is that okay, Mr. Clerk? Okay. Councillor Kim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to let it be known that I am in favor of the, uh, the amendment for uh, further uh, discussion on some of the concerns we have. And, and I just want to clarify that you know, my comments were not necessarily that uh, I'm pro this or pro that, but I think we just need to have a, a big picture look at some of our, uh, the town's interests as well. And it's not just, and I'm, I'm pro uh, affordable housing, most definitely, uh, but, you know, but we could have that in other uh, uh, variables as well. So, thank you. All right. We've all spoke. I'm going to call a vote on the referral. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. Uh, we'll take our break. We'll allow for 10 minutes. We'll come back at 9.35. If there's any other items that want to be brought up, I'll...
that's it.
All right, if we could take our seats. What's that? Yes. Well, we have quorum and. Uh, I was going to uh, suggest that we move R9 forward. That is the application for zoning bylaw. We have a gentleman here. Would someone move that we move R9 forward as we have a member in attendance? Councillor Kim, Councillor Humphreys, comments? All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, away we go. R9, will someone put that on the floor, please? Mayor Daw, thank you. Seconded. Councillor Kim, comments, questions? All right. Comments, questions? All right, and we'll just go for a vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. We'll go back to R2 now. All right. My agenda's a mess. Uh, region of York, conclusion charter, moved by Mayor Dawes, seconded by Councillor Kim. Thank you. Comments, questions? Councillor Kim. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think this inclu inclusion charter for York Region is is, is a uh, fantastic um, mandate or policy. And I think I don't think. And as I was reading this, uh, and I was trying to figure out what the tangible results of this inclusion charter is and uh, I, I think when you read uh, page seven of seven inclusion charter it's so high level it's uh, you don't really uh, really get the depth of what this is saying and, and essentially you know you, yeah, you, there's a lot of moving parts but I just wanted to kind of share uh, from my readings what this entails and, and and part of there's one part where York University is is the project lead in, in one research called Building Resilience in C Cities, and what what they're doing is they're, they're uh, researching how immigrants settle in Canada, and uh, they're looking to use their experience to see how uh, we can we can carry over that type of successful immigrant experience. And York Region also, you know, uh, kudos to, to the region, they commissioned a study um, based on Statistics Canada. Uh, they use what's called the Longitudinal Immigration Database, which looks at the landing information from Citizenship and Immigration Canada, as well as tax returns from uh, CRA, and helps us to understand the contributions immigrants are making in York Region. And at the same time, they're trying to see how they can leverage these same immigrants uh, for new immigrants uh, that are coming on board. And from a more practical perspective, you know, this this entails establishment of quiet rooms. I'm sure most of our uh, day job employers already have implemented quiet rooms for prayer. There's online diversity calendar so that people are aware of all the other diverse groups and their special holidays and uh, significant days. And uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of uh, things in here. So I just wanted to highlight them that this is not just a, a wishy-washy charter that uh, is instilled in uh, page seven. Um, and through you to, uh, I think, uh, Ms. McDougall uh, or Ms. Van Leeuwen was the, uh, the author. I know that in July 2018, York Region participated in the, uh, the Protocol on Diplomacy International for Protocol Officers Annual Education Forum. Uh, were you aware of that, that York Region participated in that? And I was just wondering who from York Region represented our region. Ms. Van Leeuwen? 
through you, Mr. Chair, I'm not 100% certain. Jim Kyle, who recently retired, was yeah. Town of Aurora representative. Okay. Um, I have met with York Region recently uh, in terms of what the next steps are. Um, and our next steps uh, will be to participate in an action planning meeting that is coming up this November. And our accessibility advisor will be uh, the new representative <coughs> as part of this, this uh, team. Okay. Uh, and my one question would be, uh, is there a timeline in terms of when all the ideas and uh, uh, the facts that's come out of all these uh, projects, um, is there a timeline as to when they're going to be implemented for each of the municipalities in York Region? Ms. Van Loy? Through you, Mr. Chair. That will be identified as part of the action plan, okay. what those items are who will take the lead on those items and what the timelines are associated with those items. Some will be maybe unique to Aurora and some will be in partnership with the other member organizations. Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to speak? Councillor Gardner. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, th I think this is a wonderful initiative and um, uh, I think as Councillor Kim was referring to, it embraces all dimensions of diversity. So um, I don't remember seeing an initiative like this that was so broad reaching, so great. Thank you, Councillor. Is there anyone else? I'll call a vote then. All those in favor, opposed, that carries. R3, no. R4. We'll go to R4. My car. Um, using the sewer use bylaw to address water discharge. Could I have someone move this? Councillor Humphreys seconded. Councillor Tom. Any speakers on this? Councillor Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and through you, just a, a quick note to uh, the clerk. I'll be asking a lot of questions, so please uh, be mindful of, of when I speak and when I'm waiting for a response from staff. Um, I guess my, my issue with this was one line in the report that says that um, the region, uh, their, their bylaw takes precedence over anything that we pass. And where there are conflicts, um, our, our bylaw will be inoperable. So I, I, I guess um, reading the report, I think it's probably, um, despite it being the sewer use bylaw, I think the majority um, of the negative environmental harms that take place have to do with water going into the storm sewers. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at the regional bylaw um, and what you can and cannot dispose of in storm sewers. Um, and I'm comparing that to what somebody would dispose of through their through their pool so I mean looking at this and and Ms. Van Leeuwen um, does pool water have two or more liquid layers Ms. Van Leeuwen through you, Mr. Chair, if I could refer that question to Marco as it was a member of his staff who prepared and has done the research I, around. But sorry, just to, to clarify, who's going to be doing the, I, I guess, Mr. Ramunov, if you'd like to um, respond, that's fine too. Mr. Ramuno. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, good question. I don't have an answer for you on that one. I'll have to get back to you on number of layers, but. I know, um, there's, I know there's a shallow end and a deep end. 
Does, does the water have a visible fi film, sheen, or discoloration? Uh, is it more than 40 degrees Celsius? Uh, the pH has to be between 6 and 9. I can go through this whole list, and, and I don't think pool water will fall into, um, you know, what can and cannot be discharged into the water. So, if the region does not mandate pool water and doesn't control pool water, um, and it excludes pool water from, from its bylaw, how can we enact a bylaw trying to regulate it if the region has, you know, precedence on this? Would that not make this entire report ultra vires because we're trying to regulate something that another jurisdiction has a mandate over, regulates on our behalf, and anything we pass is unenforceable. I am very much in favor of, uh, you know, the, the leaflet drop and, and having active conversations because I do believe that it's not in the best interest of the environment to be reduce, uh, releasing pool water, but why are we trying to, to mandate something that we have not only no business mandating, but any attempt to mandate um, is, is rendered ineffectual. Do we have access to a notwithstanding clause? Uh, that was addressed earlier, I think, by a delegate. Um, I don't know your, uh, I understand what your point of questioning is, and uh, perhaps I'll let Mr. Ramuno comment on it. Through you, Mr. Chair, just with respect to that uh, one one clause, with respect to uh, the region's, region's sewer, uh, sewer bylaw uh, having taking precedence uh. over um, the town's bylaw. I think th what we meant by that was in our discussions with, uh, with the region is that they are not going to enforce pool discharge. Uh, they're leaving it up to us. So if we uh, amend our, our, our sewer bylaw to deal with the d discharge of uh, pool water, uh, that would be our responsibility. However, with respect to any other discharges into regional uh, storm sewers, if there is a conflict outside of pool discharge, uh, the point there was that the re if there's a conflict, the regional bylaw with respect to um, any other issues apart from pool discharge uh, would, would prevail over our sewer bylaw. Again, my understanding uh, discussions with our staff in the, in the region and their bylaw is uh, they're going to leave that this up to us with respect to pool discharge if we wanted to update our uh, our bylaw. Councilor. And I guess my follow-up question to that would be, does the bylaw have a clause that says they don't have to do it, and if we want to, then it's on us? Because, you know, you can say you're not going to enforce something, but regardless of that, if it's in the bylaw, and we're putting something in that is in, contra is in opposition to what's in the bylaw, how... Somebody, a staff member's word is not the same thing as a bylaw. So, uh, I, I have difficulty with with this as a whole. So, you know, maybe there's more clarification needed. Maybe we should, instead of trying to amend a bylaw, move forward with a, a strong and robust marketing plan um, that explains. Uh, why it could be wrong. I just, I'm hesitant to, to to go down this road because it might very well be outside of our jurisdiction and alter virus. So, you know, we, we aren't spending our time wisely even discussing this. Maybe I'll, I'll ask the clerk for a comment on, on what would happen if we're discussing something that's alter virus. It's my understanding that it would be out of order and if we pass something that's out of order, what happens? Uh, Mr. Clerk, do you want to respond? I, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I do agree with Councilor Perry. If, um, it would be out of order if it's deemed to be ultra virus uh, in terms of Council discussing it. I'd have to um, 
do some research about what would happen uh, should we pass something like that. Um, probably work with the solicitor in the next week to come up with a better answer um, than the one I'm currently giving next Tuesday. So would it uh, make sense um, to split items one and two from item three and perhaps uh, refer item three back to staff right now and we can keep discussing um, you know, putting this on the town's website, which I'm sure everyone will agree with. I, I think that's what's in order. If, if we found something that may be out of order, I think it makes sense to, to set it aside for right now, get the answers to the questions that we need, to know whether or not we can debate it, and then from there um, talk about the things that, that are in order for us to talk about. All right, Councillor, we can come back if that's what you want. Or Clarify what I would like is for uh, us to only deal with what's in order. Um, so if that means referring item three right now uh, and coming back to it, you know, when we have answers as to whether or not it's in order, I, I think that would be my preference. So I'll make that motion now. To vote on one and two and refer item uh, line three? No? We can continue to discuss one and two, but let's take item three off the table right now until we get further clarification from staff. So, yeah. I'll ask for a seconder. The amendment to refer item three. Mayor Dahl is going to second it. Councillor? Uh, if it sort of falls in with what we're talking about on the amendment, why not? I'll, we'll grant a little latitude. Would anyone like to speak on the motion, which is, is it an amendment? When you're taking something up, Mr. Clerk? A referral back, okay, that's what I thought, all right. Uh, Councillor Gardner. I think Councillor Peary has a good report, and I think that the motion as it's, it is presented before us is incorrect, because on page four of the report, um, the report is talking about the educational aspects, which I absolutely agree with, and then it says uh, under recommended modifications to the sewer use bylaw, Staff will work with legal and bylaw divisions to make modifications to the town's sewer bylaw to address water, pool water discharge. So I, I, I don't think, I think that the bylaw would have to come back to council for a decision. Um, uh, so I think that the motion is incorrect because we're not really enacting a sewer use bylaw, we're asking legal and bylaw to make modifications, and I think any modifications would have to come back to council. So I, I agree with you, it's, it's misleading. It, we can't really do that until we have more information. So Le you would... Legal, especially speaking to the region, to see how that falls. But um, the other point is, with a uh, referral back to staff, it, it was clear to me that the region is not interested in doing anything with pool water discharge and leaves it up to the municipalities. And some municipalities do a bylaw and some don't. So I think, I think it's, um, I think it definitely needs clarification. Maybe we could have that for next week before you refer it back to staff. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Is there anything else? All right, if there's no other comments or questions, I'll call a vote on the amendment. The referral. All those in favor on that third clause? Opposed? That carries. So. I, I would only just state that I'm very much in favor of the education campaign. Um, and, and that's what we'll be discussing next, I'm sure, so. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Councillor. Is there anything else? Oh, uh, Councillor Gardner. Thank you. I don't think I made my point clearly. Uh, my understanding from the report is that um, the sewer bylaw isn't going to be changed. Uh, it's th this is talking about a bylaw to be enacted, part number three. Uh, but that, that doesn't seem to me to be the intent. It, it's going to go to legal and bylaw to work on the bylaw. So um, hopefully that will be addressed in the referral. Uh, I'd like to say with respect to the education component, um, if we could make it under the information that's going out to the public, could we please have something that says, please help us to help the environment? Like it's, not, it's just going, why is water from chlorine? I think we need something to try and get buy-in. And the other thing is, it's, we're defining pool uh, okay, so here it is. It's saying private swimming pool, hot tub, or spa. But the report says we just are going to call all of these pools. And so that's not very clear for the, the public. It needs to be very clear that when we're talking about pool, we're talking about hot tubs and spas as well. And uh, I don't really want to admit this, but I wasn't sure what the difference was between a grate. Uh, they're talking about emptying pools. If it's salt water, it has to go into the sanitary system. And if it's dechlorinated water, it has to go into um, the storm sewer system. So could we maybe make a diagram? The, the storm sewer system is just the square with the square uh, grate in the road with and the uh, the sanitary sewer is the round grate uh, are you asking for a clarification on that would Bishop Romano well I'm asking it says in this what's going out to the residents it says if you've got chlorine in your pool put it into the storm sewer system and if you've got salt water put it into the sanitary system and I, I didn't know which was which. The round, the grate in the road, the round one goes to the sanitary system and the square one <laughs> goes to the storm sewer system. So for people like me who weren't sure which is which, could that just information be in there? Mr. Romano? Through you, Mr. Pictures, uh, Chair. just in pictures. Through you, Mr. Oh, Chair, yes. You. So the, the concern is salt water uh, not to be discharged into the storm sewer. Uh, and the expectation there is um, not to discharge it into the sanitary manhole in the street, but to pump that in, into your house and discharge that into your, your sewer system in your house through uh, a laundry tub or et cetera. Uh, the pool, uh, chlorinated pool water uh, is fine to discharge it into the storm sewer out in the street, provided uh, you ensure that the levels of chlorine are reduced um, and, and doing you know homeowner having to do those tests and ensure that you haven't added chlorine for a certain number of days and that it, the chlorine level is uh, low enough to then discharge that into the storm sewer on the street so it's not uh, it's not har harming the, uh, uh, the vegetation within the uh, uh, downstream thank you mr. Muno and um so I, sh I could have used manhole. I know what a manhole is, so it's just, I think, <laughs> I think communications knows what I was getting at, and also the please help us help the environment, something like that, something really friendly. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any other questions, comments? I'm seeing none. I'll call a vote. All those in favor? As amended. All those opposed? It carries. I had enough on the left. They are talking about voting, so. Okay. All right, we'll go to uh, R7. R7 on parking bylaw amendment, various locations. Could I have someone put this on the floor? 
Councilor Gardner. Seconded by Councilor Maracas. Comments, questions? Councilor Gardner. Uh, I just, I, I read it, it seems to make sense to me. Uh, staff seems to have done their work on it. Um, have we had any chance for feedback from the residents? Uh, sorry, who is this? Mr. Downey, Mr. Muno? Through you, Mr. Chair, a question, response back from residents. I, I don't believe we have heard uh, um, back from residents or have any comments. With respect to Mary Street, in that instance, obviously, the, uh, as part of that road work, the bike lanes um, already, you know, already in place, so on-street parking currently isn't, isn't permitted, uh, isn't possible, but we still need to amend the bylaw. Uh, and I think there, was, there, there has been communication with respect to um, uh, the restrictions on Mill, Mill Cliff and Timpson. Um, um, uh, by staff, but I'll certainly uh, just need to confirm that. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Uno. I'm, I, I don't know, it doesn't say, or I missed it, if this was resident generated or town generated, but if it's resident generated, then I think we should put them in the loop. Thank you. For the comments? Seeing none, I'll call a vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries, Mr. Clerk. Mr. Clerk, we're on R9 now. R10. Pending list. My fave. Um, anyone like to put the pending list on? A mover, a seconder. Councillor Tom, seconded by Councillor Kim. Comments, questions? Councillor Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have questions somewhere. <laughs> somewhere in this pile of paper, I have questions. Um, uh, in particular, uh, on the pending list, um, there's, there's, there's some really old pending items. So through you, Mr. Chair, to m clerk, do, do they kind of, at some point, do they just kind of go off the pending list when they've been on too long? A statute of limitations. <laughs> Mr. Clerk. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, not one I'm aware of in this case. Um, we would certainly need direction from council or have them shown as completed and uh, not have council motion anything regarding them to remove them off the list. So how do we get them forward? Like, do we just leave them kind of forever? Mr. Clerk. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. I, don't, I certainly don't think anything would last forever. Um, we try to we, we try our best to uh, in the far right column with the response uh, and status. If there's any particular questions you have about where where something's at, I would I think that, that would, would be helpful. Be, okay, that would so, be an appropriate time. Um, at the risk of boring council further, uh, so the on page H um, C S two. This is a request for an encroachment agreement, 29 Mendes Forest. It's from the middle of 2015. I, I'm thinking we were gonna do a town-wide study or something. I don't know if anyone on council remembers, but. So then, oh, here it says encroachment bylaw in draft form. Policy under review by operations. So, Mr. Downey, that's now your department, I think. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot for that, but I just, I mean, if, there's, if there is anything happening with it, then 
we could know. <laughs> no, I mean, just, if you could just, um, with respect to, I'm on page 10, with respect to the sign bylaw review, it says it's partially completed. I thought we, I thought we completed that. So, um, it's page 10, it's CS10 at the very bottom. We'll just allow the director to locate that. Ms. Van Loen? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, this is in reference to the A-frame portable signs. And so I brought forward the report to the July council meeting. I haven't completed the amendments yet, so those oh, okay. are still outstanding. I just need to bring forward the amending bylaw. Thank you very much. Thank you. On page 13, um, OPS 2, um, I have a motion that is talking about doing red light cameras in um, community safety zones, including photo radar. Uh, this would be for you, Mr. Clerk. Um, I have a motion pending about when the province um, approved photo radar cameras. Um, that uh, we should be putting them, or at least deciding if we want to put them in the town park area and in community safety zones or other areas of interest. So um, it's, it says it's coming back. I, I would like to know if it could come back in January as opposed just to coming back indefinitely. Mr. Muno? Mr. Muno? Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Chair, we'll do our best. Uh, we are intended to bring it back in uh, January. I'll speak to our traffic analyst to see how uh, whether we can uh, move that up uh, um, early in the new year, January or February, if possible. Thank you so much. As it is a safety issue, the sooner we get to it, the better. On page 17, uh, PDS 5, uh, the community energy plan um, seems to have fallen off the table. I'm not sure what we're waiting for and how we're going to proceed. I don't know who could speak to that on staff. Mr. Muno? Mr. Muno? Through, through you, Mr. Chair. I think with that item, based on our last discussion, we we're waiting for this climate change uh, adaptation plan uh, prior to bringing back um, um, this this item. But again, I'll certainly uh, go back and speak to staff with respect to the timing on, on that item. Thank you. My remembrance is that um, we were hoping to get some um, government funding and that we were waiting on hearing back about the government funding. So um, if you... That was a... Mr. Through you, Mr. Chair, to Mr. Romano? Through you, Mr. Chair, I, th I think that was in relation to a, a different item, the community energy plan, and I think it's also on this list. Numbers. Ah, uh, I'm mixing the community energy plan. Uh, it's the next one, number six, Councilor Gardner. Yep. Thank you. So, um, uh, anything that has to do with the environment, if we could just try and figure out how to get it on the table, would be great. And the last one is on page 19. Um, it's marked as com uh, PDS 13. It's my motion on the stable neighborhoods. It's marked as completed. Um, but my motion was talking. <laughs> my motion was talking about looking at the um, our bylaws and were they in agreement with the official plan? And I don't think. We've done a lot of work on this, but I don't think we actually did that. Mr. Mr. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, no, you're correct, Council Gardner. It shouldn't identify. It shouldn't be identified as completed because we're still. It's still a work in process. So uh, we'll up, we'll update that. Thank you very it's much. It's still ongoing. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Maracas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, through you to Mr. Ramuno, Mr. Ramuno. Um, Sorry, I'm just pulling it up here. Uh, the Canadian Tire, I can't seem to find it. I lost it there. Oh, so PDS 12 on page 19. 
in regards to the, Canadian, the old Canadian Tire. It says pending. It says Canadian Tire has advised staff that the site has not sold and that they wish to proceed with the rezoning of the property to add commercial uses. And I'm just wondering when would uh, council be looking at that coming back or the future council? Yes, but I'm just, yeah, a time frame. Uh, Mr. Through you, Mr. Uh, Chair, we're probably looking at sometime in 2019. My last discussions with them, uh, they they put it on hold with respect to even that that rezoning application to expand the commercial uses. They were still in discussions with other partners with respect to a, a more you know, fulsome redevelopment opportunity on that site. But I will follow up with them and update the uh, that item uh, accordingly in the new year. Thank you, Mr. Romano, and then. Um, I'm not sure who will answer this one, but PDS 18 on page 21 in regards to name submissions for Library Square uh, still says pending, but I, my understanding is that the committee has met. Um, so I'm just wondering when we will hear uh, some results in regards to uh, naming of the Library Square. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, the CAO and myself will be discussing that uh, hopefully tomorrow, and so we'll be able to get an answer out to Council shortly. Thank you. And then just one more PDS 19. The next one in regards to local appeals body. I'm just wondering, is there is there any talks happening at the region in regards to this? Um, and if they are not, and if they're not looking at moving forward, is this something that maybe we should just look at moving forward with? Because I think it's an important issue that we develop a appeals body for our committee of adjustment uh, decisions. So. Mr. CAO. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the issue was raised at the uh, regional CAO's table, and um, uh, the CAO for the region was going to look further into it, and we were going to put it on the subsequent agenda, so I can ask for a follow-up on that. So, just as a follow-up through you, Mr. Chair, so we're probably looking at next term. <laughs> correct. So, yeah, similarly to most of the stuff that's pending, correct? Correct. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Gardner, is there anyone for the first time? Councilor Gardner for a second. Uh, thank you. I got mixed up between PDS 5 and 6. So with respect to the, the community energy plan, um, could you repeat the answer or Mr. CEO, could you tell us where we're at with this? Mr. Ramuno? Certainly through Mr. Chair, we were still waiting to hear from, uh, uh, from the ministry with respect to the, uh, the grant. And, you know, we haven't heard back, but as soon as we uh, uh, are made aware of the opportunities for additional grant, we will bring the item forward. That was the one outstanding item, confirmation of the uh, Ministry of the Environment grant to the municipality. Thank you. Uh, through you to Mr. CAO, perhaps Mr. CAO, I thought we were, municipalities were mandated to have a community energy plan or strongly encouraged to have a community energy plan. So we have to do one anyway. I mean, really, we have to do one anyway to be serious about helping the environment. So what do you suggest with this? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, if memory serves me correctly, and I can confirm this uh, uh, tomorrow, I believe that we were eligible for a grant for about 50% of it, but we're trying to, we also are eligible for another 50%. So we're just trying to get the whole 100% um, funding for the project um, but yes uh, communities are encouraged to do community energy plans for sure but uh, there's two mechanisms to get that funded with uh, from other lo levels of government that's what we're pursuing provincial and federal well we're going to be in a council hiatus for a while and we won't be bothering staff with all of these questions perhaps that's something <laughs> seriously perhaps that's something staff could work on so that maybe as soon as we a new council comes forward, they can try and get that in place. Thank you. Well, if I don't see, and I don't, uh, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries, Mr. Clerk. And I think our last item is our 11. Alternate forms of notice. Sale of properties to Metrolinx. Would someone uh, put this on, uh, move this item? Seconder? Moved by Councilor Gardner, seconded. 
Councillor Humphreys. Comments, questions? Councillor Gardner. Uh, to be honest, I didn't read this, so could staff give us a precy of what this means? Or if somebody else on council read Mr. this through? Mr. Serial. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so when we do sales of properties, we have to declare them surplus. And we also have to provide public notice to the public, notice to the public. Um, in this case, we didn't have enough time. Typically, public notice is two weeks in newspaper. And oh. when we give notice, I would like a proper legal description and certain yeah. requirements met. Um, unfortunately, Metro Lynx wasn't able to provide us with that information until recently. So part of the sale of lands bylaw that we have to declare land surplus, in lieu of public notice on a newspaper, we can have council declare another form of notice. And putting a report on agenda is typically seen as another form of notice. So that's oh. all that this is. And this report was initially a closed session report because that's where we have our land purchases and acquisitions and sales. Um, so this is just the follow-up part. And typically you don't get reports. You just get the bylaw on the agenda, which will come next week because this is all done internally. So, so does this gives the appropriate public, public notice period? Yes. Well, not the two weeks. It'll be a shorter period. But these are properties that do not affect any homeowners. They're all along the Barry Rail Corridor. So we feel, staff feels that the public doesn't need the full two weeks Excuse notice. Me. So through you, Mr. Chair, so this is just an exception? Yes. This is just happening in this one case? Yes. Okay, thank you. Councillor Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and just um, one item I had a hard time reading in the report due to the size of font. Um, wondering if we could go through each of the four parcels and just state how large the parcels are. Because, you know, I, I tried zooming in and um, I'm having a really hard time reading it on the maps, exactly, so. Mr. Chair? Through, through you, Mr. Chair. Unfortunately, I can't give you that information right now, but I can figure that out for next week. They're just tiny parcels. Yep. I, I, so what, do you, what would you like, the square, the footage? The I, you, square footage is probably the, the most adequate size. Okay. Um, because I, I don't think these are acres, but it's tough no. to see um, just with with these images. I, I, I do recall there was this in the summary, not on this report, but there was a total acreage involved. We're in closed session, so hopefully it's just a matter of recouping that. Okay. Councillor? Fair enough, okay. Seeing no further questions, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor? One, two, three, four. Opposed? Can't tell. That's a go. It carries, Mr. Clerk. All right, next order of business. Uh, notice of motion that's for council. New business. <clears throat> May I start with you, Councilor Maracas? <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to. Mr. Ramuno, Mr. Ramuno, in regards to the lights at Ballymore, well, just, just north of Ballymore on Bayview there, um, we received an email in regards to the, the warrants were met at the regional level. Uh, I'm just wondering if we can get that data and it can be supplied to the members of council so we can have a better understanding of how those warrants were met. Mr. Ramuno. Through you, Mr. I've had discussions with the region. Certainly, I'll, I'll see what data they can pass on to us and I'll share it with council. I would appreciate that. And then can we also look at possibly um, uh, asking the region to install a do not block intersection signage and then having that similar to what we have on Center Street? So, because currently what's, what's occurring is, is people are stopping at the lights and they're backing up and then people trying to make a left out of Ballymore can't get out. And so if we can kind of create that do not block intersection, uh, I think that would help out a lot of the residents in that area.
If, if I could just add, um, Mr. Ramuno, the timing of the lights. So I've traveled it and the light goes red and there's no cars or whatever it is that senses that people want to exit the shopping center. I'm sure that's going to happen, but it, I noticed it just about two weeks ago. Maybe it's already taken effect. Councilor Gardner, or, or is there more? Um, I was going to say, it's not really a new business. Can we do some public service announcements considering it's a big weekend? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. All right. Don't worry about it then. I, I can or see Councillor Perry's in that mood, so we'll continue. Councillor Gardner. Thank you. Uh, this is a question to Mr. Muno. Mr. Muno, uh, can you tell us what the plans are? This is with respect to the stable neighborhoods. What are the plans to move the design guidelines ahead so that they will be ready for the next council? Mr. Ramuno? Certainly through you, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, obviously, as per Council's direction, my plans are to come back in a new year, schedule another public meeting. We're also going to reach out to the uh, various um, ratepayers associations um, this fall to sit down with them again to have a discussion on uh, our zoning review as well as uh, the architectural guidelines. And uh, we will be working to initiate the preparation of those guidelines with, again, input from the various ratepayers associations uh, so that we have something ready uh, sometime in a, in a new year when we come back to council at the, uh, for a, a public uh, planning meeting on the item. Uh, thank you, Mr. Muno. I, I thought there was some discussion about hiring a consultant to do that work. Mr. Ramuno? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, that's correct. We'll need to, uh, I'm already having some discussions with uh, some control architects to see if we can uh, get someone on board to assist with the preparation of those actual final documents. Yep. First thing, though, is we will sit down with the ratepayers to, again, continue to have that discussion with respect to how we treat each individual uh, neighborhood. Councillor? Um. Thank you, and um, with respect to, I, I think it was stated at some meeting that we would need to hire outside help for this. Could we make sure that it's somebody who specializes in this? Certainly. Will Thank do. you. Councillor Thompson. Yep. Mayor Dahl. Yep. Councillor Humphreys. Councillor Tom. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I don't know if this is possible at this point in time, but I'd be interested in getting a memorandum put on next week's agenda from staff regarding a specific issue that was brought up, I believe, in the summer, um, and uh, so I could be corrected if I'm wrong, but I believe staff made an administrative change to the standard operating guidelines for uh, right of entry or bylaw that took effect on September the 1st. And I would just like an understanding as to if that was under the delegated authority that we issued for um, the purposes of uh, the lame duck provisions or the election coming up to staff. Um, obviously, there was a, a great length. We discussed the standard operating guidelines at council. And when it came up, uh, I believe, at the last council meeting about adding in an amendment to uh, those guidelines, we dis it didn't go anywhere, and so uh, again, I'd just like to know, A, that I'm correct in my assumption or in my um, understanding that the standard operating guidelines were amended or that that vacant housing uh, was exempted, and I'd just like to know if, if staff, if that's part of the delegated authority that council gave to staff. Um, so I'd just like a memorandum outlining that, uh, unless it can be discussed or described uh, tonight. Uh, this, Mr. CEO, to you, Mr. Chair, we'll uh, we'll update you via memo. Thank you, Mr. CEO, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilor Kim, Councilor Perry. I'll start with public service announcements. We don't have them. We don't have those. No closed session. Motion to adjourn. Councilor Perry, Councilor Tom, all in favor.